Welcome to the Theory of DFS podcast. I'm Jordan Cooper, the co-author of the Theory of Daily Fantasy Sports. 15-hour audio DFS masterclass you can pick up at theoryofdfs.com for another episode with a guy we haven't we haven't seen on, on this show, at least. We see all the time on lulls, right? It's Brian Hooper, uh, Brick75, Brian Hooper underscore underscore on Twitter, and... I even ha- I even have I even have your jersey. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. I want <laughs> I want to send I want to send this to you because there's no there's no way that I'm actually gonna wear it. I did it as a as a as a as a gag for that episode on lulls that you were complaining that people wear other people's jerseys. And right. The DFS jersey has lull seventy five. <laughs> then on the back, brick seventy five. It's a custom made basketball jersey. Uh, it costs like sixty sixty five to to make. And then Pete loved it so much that I got another one for him. Uh, <laughs> so afterwards, you have to send me your. There's no reason for me to. I don't know. I have. I, I've had it on this hanger up here, and on on this uh, on my closet for like two years for no reason. But uh, but I think it's a good souvenir for you. All right, I'll take it. Thank you. I will take it. I I I, I never really had a, an opinion on wearing your own username on your back, so. I have to think about that one. Oh, so it's okay if to wear a jersey of yourself. I get, I mean, because uh, your whole stance was that you have another guy's name on your back that you don't. Right. Even, it's a stranger to you that you don't even know. Yeah, who's like half your age a lot of the time. You know? It's <laughs> weird. But you you wouldn't mind if it was your own name. If well, I have to think about it. I was saying since you're all since you're you're sending this to me, I have to. I mean, because I could also you know put it on the wall. Mm-hmm. And not wear it. Uh, wearing your own name. I mean, also it's always acceptable if it's a bit. So like, if you're wearing some player who's you know funny or something. Like I saw this guy at the gym, and I wanted to take a, a pic, like a picture of him, but it was it was like too creepy. You know, he's too close to me, and he's wearing a Danica Patrick uh, jersey with ripped off tees, uh, ripped off you know a tee with ripped off sleeves. Okay. And I'm like, is this a bit? Or real? Like, is he just like I'm a I like Danica Patrick, and I sometimes I rip my sleeves off my. Or is he, you know, a Danica Patrick going to gym guy? Funny, he thinks hipsterish. Well, do you think the humor is because it's a female driver? Yeah, because yeah, it's a female old school female driver, and you're a big dude going to the gym. I, I, have, I have a I have a soccer jersey um, that that is a for a woman, but it's a men's soccer jersey. Right. Yes. Is that okay? And, is that okay? So like. Here, Racing Louisville is the NWSL team here. They have women's jerseys and men's jerseys because the women's jerseys are like little fitted differently. and Right, and usually right. a V-neck or something. Right, right. They have a V-neck, but they do have a men's jersey, which means it's meant to be worn by a man, which is not the jersey that the women wear on the field, but it's still the men's fit jersey that has, you know, the number and name on the back. Is that, would that be weird? Well, the, the rule is it's a bit. If it's a bit, then no, it's well, always it's not, I'm telling you it's not a bit. It's just that I'm a fan of the team. No, and- then that, I think that's weird. Yeah, wearing wearing some lady's name on your back that you don't know and you've never met. It's strange. This makes but sense. But if it was my other- name. So if I had a female, if I had a racing Louisville women's soccer jersey with Cooper on the back, that would be fine, even though it's a women's soccer team and I wouldn't be allowed on the team. I guess yeah. If you have if you have your own name on it, that's fine. I guess. I don't know. I think that's pretty kind of weird too. But uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess it's not as weird as wearing some eighteen year old, eighteen year old's name on your back. Yeah, like but you wear hats like, of teams, right? Like you're. But it's always a bit. This is Chase Hooper. Okay. Uh, this is his hat. So, so I bought all his your hat. hats are bits. Yeah, or I have hats that I, I I have them over there, but or hats have nothing, no logos, nothing. They're just oh, so you don't have like a Cubs hat or something like that. No. Oh, so so at least you're consistent. That like I thought maybe players not not okay, but teams are fine. Yeah, but also if you want to wear, I guess that's that's not weird to wear a Bears hat or something like that. But you're a fan of the team. Yeah, that's fine. But why can't but... I be fan of a player? But that's weird, wearing their name on their back, yeah. Why can't I be a fan of David Montgomery? Because he's just another grown man who you don't know, you don't care about. And uh, and also, too, I think being a fan of teams is kind of weird in general. <laughs> so, like, I'd be fine with with no uh, no Bears hats, too. 
Okay, so you can consistent with that because I was gonna I was gonna shift it over to how about the sports where it's individuals. It's like wearing a Walmart hat, like wearing Jeff Bezos's name on your back or Jeff Bezos's kid. It's like like oh man, he's gonna be a great CEO one day. <laughs> it's like, why are you well, that's not a competition. The thing is, is that I'm a fan. Gonna... I love the, I I love Amazon. I'm a huge fan. I got I buy all their stuff. It's it just fandom in general makes no sense just because you were born relatively close to a stadium that no longer exists, right? With like employees there who aren't from your state. They aren't from that area. They aren't anything like you. They don't know who you are. And you have they this. They probably actively look down upon you. I bet a lot of them do. I mean, and like, yeah, when you work there, I've worked minor league baseball for three, four years. And like, yeah, you make fun of all the fans. They're fucking losers. <laughs> they don't, some of the employees don't like you. You know, the players don't know who you are. You know, and like, um, it's it's uh, it's it's strange. The whole the whole thing is is really strange if you just like sit down and put it in context to have the things. How about a fan yet. of of entertainment in general? Like, what if you're a fan, if you're a fan of a comic book? If you have a Superman shirt, an X Men shirt. Yeah, I think just enjoying entertainment is different than being a fanatic. But you would be against having a having. I have a Batman shirt. Like, like if like like enjoying Stephen King's books and stuff is different than wearing Stephen King jerseys, following him around the country, you know, going up and trying to get his autograph all the time. That's over the line. That's crazy, weird shit. I don't like. I don't think that's not how you how uh, normal people uh, behave most of the time in almost any other context. So you so you have no fan of. You're not a fan of anything then. No, I mean, I, d it depends on, I mean, we're talking like sports fandom is a specific thing. So like, uh, you know, fan means fanatic and like I, going around buying all their stuff and stuff like that. I don't know. I don't do that, but like I watch TV shows and Star Wars and stuff. And by the way, I used to do that when I was younger. And you, what, and why is that? Why is your stance different now? I don't, I don't, I lost the, that, uh, tribal affiliation. That or just the identity of, of like I'm like look I'm wearing a Rondo Grinder shirt now it's representing that, make, that makes more sense you're like employed by them they give you money <laughs> you know like that shirt was probably free like right. that like this this those things all make sense but I'm wearing yeah. a DraftKings hat that I got for free also but like this tribal this tribal uh, you know condition mental condition that that we have of picking sides and friend versus enemy, I think is a lot of like evolutionary based tricks your mind plays on you. And so when you're not like really sitting down and thinking about it for a little bit, you're like, yeah, no, I'm a fucking bears fan, dude. And you know, fuck the Packers. Um, you know, and like you see a bears trinket and you buy it and, um, you follow them around the country and stuff like that. No, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make much, much sense, but, Going to a game and enjoying it, the experience, or it's a watching souvenir. red zone, getting, you go stuff to, like that. It's, it's something that you can attach yourself to. It's like I remember the experience. Yeah. These are two different things, though. Oh, but then, that, but you're judging it as if it's always the same. I go, I go to wrestling shows and I buy wrestling shirts and I, I get a, a autographed eight by tens and photos. And to me, to me, I'm never a, I've never been a collector, right? Yeah. I'm not like there are plenty of people that collect toys. They collect baseball cards. They collect, and to me, like outside of like investment value, I don't really care much about it. I I like connect collecting experiences, and to me, if I could get something that commemorates the experience, I think that has enough value to me. Like I, I have a camera roll full of you know photos with wrestlers or whatever like that. It's not that it's like oh I'm a big fan and I'm going to travel around and whatever like that. It's it's like, no, I remember going to this event, having a good time. And here are some photos that here are the people that I met. And I could go back and remember, remember that time. But it's not that I like what, 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 what is the difference between that and any other type of fan? Well, I think from uh, like a normal sports fans uh, perspective, making fun of people who like wrestling is kind of weird because it's very similar. Like there's not a whole a whole Same thing lot. for comic book movies and Different. you know anime or sci-fi or any of that type of stuff. 
Yeah. So like my, my, so like from my perspective, a guy wearing a Jersey of a wrestler, I can't name one, but whatever you name one for me is the same thing as wearing a De La Cruz Reds Jersey. It's the same thing. Okay. Yeah. So like, I think it's ridiculous. Both of you, him and (laughs) you and him. (laughs) I'm a fan of their, 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 their artwork, their performance. Yeah. That's, that's, that's fine. I mean, like, I guess like, like I'll try to be uh, like on your side for a second. Maybe, maybe you could think of it as like buying a piece of art. No, I don't know if that even works. I'm trying to. It's self-identification. I, I, th- I still think it I doesn't think like have wearing to be a Picasso jersey and stuff like that. And but like I mean, you could, arguing but the thing with is, people. Is that you could, it just has, it has not been, it's not been mainstreamed that that's like a normal thing. But I see no reason why you can't be like, well, do I get a blank black t-shirt or do I put something that is essentially melding my identity with something else to show I'm showing the world that I'm a fan of X. So it's definitely identity melding. Yeah. Right. right. But it doesn't yeah. have to be tribal. It doesn't have to be like, well, I have, I have a, like with sports, it's easy to say that it's tribal because I have a Reds Jersey and then someone else has a Cubs Jersey and I ate like, but it doesn't have to be that. Well, like a I lot think of times even at, wrestling at, at, is tribal too. Like, um, you know, it's like, no, like uh, this is my thing, you know, this is this is but that's how you meet mine. other people where it's your thing. Like the thing about wrestling t-shirts is that you wear one and you go out to, to, to Kroger and maybe you bump into someone that goes, Hey, did you go to that thing last week? Like, like this is a way to identify how you could cluster sure, people that sure, yeah. the same thing. If it's a clearly something that identifies, I would never disagree with that. But um, I think wrestling for for some for a decent amount of wrestling fans they kind of came to that um, their fandom organically where a lot of sports fans, not that this is right or wrong either way. They didn't like, they, they were just like, this is my team. Cause you live there. Cause, Cause where I you live, live here. Yeah. Right. And, and that used to be, if you go back in the day before, you know, the, the, when players had to have second jobs, like the players for the team were from the community, but now essentially what? you're, you're rooting for a franchise that happens to be located. The bra- that branch of that of that league is located in your city, but it really doesn't represent your community. Anymore. Right, and the stadiums were there longer and stuff, and like, yeah, it does. It, it like the stadiums aren't even around you anymore. You know, like um, like the Golden State Warriors, right? They used to have the stadium in Oakland. Now it's like all the way across the bay or something like that. It's like. So you still a fan. And then, you know, when the team leaves, a lot of times the fans don't like them anymore. So like, so were you really a fan? <laughs> you know, why do you not like them anymore? Right. Why, why don't, why don't you like your the backyard? Los Angeles Raiders if you're from Oakland? Right. Right. Why do, so you, like, like, clearly... why do you like the Rams if you're from St. Louis? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just like also wrestlers are a, uh, like adults a lot of the time and, and, and athletes are often, especially college or like teenagers. Um, so it's well, that's weird. What I, that, but that in and of and itself, I find Ru- weird. Out here, out here in Louisville, out here in Louisville, I mean, college basketball is much, is way bigger than NBA. And you go on sports talk radio and you hear, you hear 55 year olds like passionately, like, demeaning like the play of like 18 year old kids that don't get paid. <laughs> right, right. Right. And it's well, like, it's get, little... some of them can get paid now, which is good. Right. But, but the disparity there does feel weird to me. Like I, and here's another difference with the wrestling is like, these are paid actors, you know, physical actors. So listening to, you know, one of those old Ric Flair videos or something is funny. Like listening to Ric Flair is hilarious. But then I don't want to listen to some 19 year old kid tell me about anything he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like, oh, like, oh, my God, let's see what uh, uh, what's I can't even know his first name. Dela Cruz thinks from the, you know, from the Reds. Oh, my God. This is so like post post uh, interviews and stuff like that. I don't care. Like, it's just watching the gladiators on the field is interesting. But I don't 
I don't want to like uh, I, I don't want to worship them or I have no affiliation with them other than this interesting product they're providing as entertainment and everything else is uh, weird. Do you think a lot a lot of your 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 hate of fandom comes from the fact that once you start playing like fantasy sports and betting and where the interest in the games are more for your own your your own benefit rather than like the team like for me personally like when i was in high school like i i followed sports religiously i had nothing on the line right even in my 20s like i would follow mostly soccer and i guess i would root for some teams but now it's gotten to the point where i mean you say it on lulls it's like what's the last time you watched a baseball game yeah i haven't in years I, I do just clarify small point of clarification. I don't hate fandom. I don't care. I just don't like, I just think it's weird. I'm just pointing it out. And so people think that just by arguing in one way that I have to like have a strong stance on whatever. Do you look else down does. upon people that, that I, wear guess, I look down on uh, most people on anyways. So, right. <laughs> uh, it's just a part of the, part of the deal, you know? So, but like, yeah, I don't, I do not care if you're a sports fan and, I, and you, if you enjoy it, that's great. I'm happy where I really do not care. Well, that, so, that's but, why I think, that's why I think for, for us, for daily fantasy sports players, for sports betters, prop betters, anything like that, we need to have our own uniforms Right, so we could have something to like. So you 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 do have your your brick seventy five jersey, and the brick seventy five jersey is whatever your teams happen to be on that day. True. Yeah. Right. I guess. So technically, isn't that what you're? If you if you left the house on a given day, mm -hmm. right? Let's say you put you put in your your you put in your 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 uh, baseball lineups, and then you went out to the supermarket, and you said, you know what, I want to identify with my team. But your team isn't the Cubs or the Brewers. It's Brick 75 on DraftKings. And you go out with a DraftKings jersey with yeah. it. And it and even let's say you put all the you have all the, the names, all your entire your entire player pool is on your back, right? All 88 players. And you could even have one of those, one of those things, you know, those word, I don't know what they're called, where it, it shows like the bigger words are the ones that are ones mentioned more. Yes. Like the diagram. Right. And the, the players that you have more of more exposure to are bigger. The ones that we have only in one lineup are smaller. And that's what's on the back of your jersey. Yeah. Would that, that, would that be, be suitable for you? Because now you you that is a team that you are that is something yeah. you are actively rooting for. That's true. That's true. And if they had an MLB red zone with my guys, I would watch it. <laughs> if it just cut to the yeah. bats and the pitches of the people. Yeah, that, yeah. In a smart, in a smart way, but yeah, yeah. Right. If it was cutting between the, my guys for the most part, I, I would watch that channel too. I mean, the problem is, is that it would have to change every day. Um, oh yeah, the jersey idea is never never gonna work. Well, how about in best ball? In be hey, in best ball, you could, yeah, for a year, right? Yeah, unless you do a bunch of different tournaments, no, but then you do the same thing on the back. The bigger the more money you have invested in a player, the bigger their name is on the back of your back of your jersey. Yeah, no, I get it. It makes it makes sense. I, I understand your analogy. I still, uh, I, I mean, I still, that I think that would be weird. Like just to other people, like they would be like, that jersey's weird. Right. <laughs> you know? but, it, but it would make logical but sense. But actually too. it's just as weird as your, uh, you know, not your Jordan, but the fans love of uh, whatever sport their sport is. And do, do you, do you ever get, do you ever get into these conversations with other people when it comes to playing lineups that, they understand that that you're playing fantasy sports, but they don't understand that you're playing multiple lineups. That people, like people like uh, like my my wife's mother or brothers or something, they'll come over or something, and they'll be like, you know, maybe 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 I have MMA on or UFC or something because I will watch UFC, and they'll ask you, it's like, oh, what, who, which one are you rooting for? And they're not, they know that it's it's fantasy that it's like. Do you have either got either of these guys in your lineup? Yeah, both and, of them. <laughs> right, right. That's it. Right, exactly. And then they, then all of a sudden, when you say that, it's like, 
I we always have to say I would prefer if this guy won, but it's not. If this guy wins, I hope he wins with a lot of points, right? And then they're like, "What? How? How are you not rooting for? Like, who's on? Because they they always go back to, well, do you have either of these guys on your team? Like, it's at least people that understand that. Oh, you choose six fighters into a lineup, but they don't get the fact that right. I could have a hundred lineups, and they all have different people, and they're like. Why would you play a fighter in one lineup and then the opponent in the other lineup? Because they obviously don't understand the fact of like, like I'm not trying to predict who wins. I'm just trying to build lineups that like are profitable to win a lot of money yeah. regardless of that. Right. Like, do you get into those conversations at all? A little bit. Not really. Like MMA. You don't go though. out much. So probably you don't. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You have to know people, Jordan. Uh, the, uh, um, MMA, though, is the easiest to explain, I think, out of all of them. Because really, you just go, I want that guy to punch that guy in the face 200 times. <laughs> like, okay, I get it. Yeah, you but know, you that... could have both of the fighters. I mean, it but could that's be fine. That... Or, and then you could go further if you want to. You could go, or if the other guy wins, I want him to punch him in the face 200 times. But I but prefer there's, this there's guy. Sometimes there's some, at some point of the night, you switch to. I don't want uh, either of these guys to win. Right, right. You want it so that I, I hope they stare at each other. Right. That's easy to explain, though. That's easy to explain. Right. Yeah. It's we're, less we're, easy to explain for, like, NFL. Right. NFL, like, good luck. Like, the easiest NFL would be, like, I hope, like, the Cincinnati Bengals score 50 points and most of it goes to Chase and Higgins. Right. Something like that. But, like, even that's that's kind of hard hard to explain. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, I yeah, those conversations are the worst. You know, like uh, – I don't know. I've, I've I've gotten used to it. Like it's usually sports betting now. They think so. It's like sports betting. Like, yeah, it's like kind of like sports betting. Yeah, whatever. Right. But the thing the thing about sports betting though is that that do you find that now that things are becoming kind of blurred together that the general public like it it feels like. If I if I tell my my in laws that you know like they know that I that I play daily fantasy sports they think of it as sports betting, but when explained it's like oh oh they they, they view it more as a skill based they understand fantasy you having a fantasy football league they just don't understand the fact that it's every day and you're not drafting you're just selecting based on salaries like they don't they don't understand that but the sports betting stuff they they understand. But they just assume that if you bet on sports, you're you're you you're not a winner. Like it, feel, it almost feels like like at least to me that the general public views fantasy sports as a game that can be beaten, while sports betting is not a game and it can't be beaten. Yeah, I agree with that. It's, it's getting a little better. It's getting a little better. So when we were younger, it was definitely had a bigger stigma. Than it does now, and that's all the that's all casino lobbying propaganda to keep you know to keep sports books from happening uh, since you know two thousand since two thousand three there two thousand three was kind of the glory age of online sports betting like all the youngsters won't won't know this but net net teller was like the online banker pre PayPal and you could get money easily to thirty sports books with bonuses. And bonus hunt 100k a year if you wanted, maybe not that much, but something like that. Back then, uh, although you'd be smarter to play, just get good at poker <laughs> in 2003. But um, those those days are you know long long behind us. But they were fighting that wave with the UIEGA law, the you know all the all the bills uh, all gang bills are mostly familiar with that they would pass, you know, with midnight hour and attach them to two other bills that had, like had nothing to do with, with gambling that were going to pass for certain. And uh, that propaganda came along with that. And, you know, people just believe what they're told. And so they go, Oh, okay. Sports betting. You know, it's just like mob related. And uh, I saw a casino, you know, but although even in casino De Niro's character beats sport, sports betting. Uh, but I think usually through, like finding information, uh, like underhanded information, but uh, yeah, it's it's from the movies, The Wild Wild West, 
stories, all that type of stuff is just baked into the cake. But I think young people, I think it's kind of flipping and more international the the audience get with the internet. So like, you know, in, you know, this England's had sports betting for uh, what a hundred years or forever, really. And uh, you know, other countries have it, have had it forever. So like the more it becomes more mainstream and the, the news articles start laying off. Uh, although when they need it, they'll, they'll pressure it again and they'll wheel up some idiot kid who lost his daddy's uh, money on a DraftKings sports book when they need, when they need something to happen. So it'll happen again. But, but I think, but, do you, but uh, the question I have is, do you think that I find that the general public, and this is the general public, not general public that plays any of this, that does any of this, even poker, as because of the boom in the 2000s, is looked at as a game of skill, is looked at as the general public under may they may not understand like the exact probabilities and hand ranges and everything like that. But they get the fact that like it's the game isn't about trying to make a Royal flush, right? It's a, it's, it's a game competing against other people. And there are probabilities of making certain hands versus the amount of money that you wager, you know, like the, like they may not call They may not know what EV or expected value is, but they get that. It's, it's, it's a math based game. Fantasy sports, they also view in the, in the the spectrum of even in a season long, in your office league, it's like, oh, this guy knows football more than anyone. He's going to draft the better players at draft at better positions, right? He's going to know who to pick at what spots and who to start and sit. And it's like, yeah, that is. But we're of course basing it based on probabilities, right? You you build projections and you go, well, who should I start? Who should I sit? Should I correlate? Should I like, but their perception of it is still based around skill, skillful probabilities. But then when it comes to sports betting, it, I almost find any conversation I've had with someone that, that is unfamiliar with it. It comes down, it, it comes down to like odds don't exist. So just, it's like, Oh, who do you think is going to win the game? Is it going to be the, the dolphins or the Texans? And I'm like, like, and if I said, oh, I've, I, let's say I said, I, I got, the, I got the Texans and they're like, well, the Texans are horrible. It's like, yeah, but I, I, I got, the, I got them at plus 280. Yeah. Right. And they're like, like, yeah, but they're a long shot. To, you, you're going to win. It's like, yeah, but you know, if I, if I get them at, at, at plus 400, all I'm saying is that I think they're going to win more than 20% of the time. Right. But they, but the, the main, like, they could understand that in other aspects, like poker, but they can't understand that in in sports betting because I get I, I've talked to people when I play even when I play poker, so I go out and play poker and inevitably you know someone's looking at some people are betting on sports or something some conversation happens or I'm looking at my laptop or something and they go oh okay uh, uh, I didn't you, you bet on baseball and I go I go kind of I mean. I say I I do prop bets, and they look at me funny, and they go, or or I don't even say that, and they go, you know, oh, you bet. Uh, did, who do you got? Who do you got in the baseball games tonight? And I go, I, I don't got teams. I got I got I got pitchers. I got, and they look, and it's like it's like they've never heard of this side. And these are people that play poker. I mean, like these are people that are at least around there. And any conversation I hear at the poker table, like I never hear odds. And these are people that play poker and they're decent poker players. And it's like, oh yeah, I got, uh, I got the, you know, I got, you know, what it was college basketball or, you know, I got the Dodgers tonight, you know, on the run line, which is like a minus one ten bet or something like that. But, but when I bring up, it's like, yeah, I got, I got Kevin Galsman over five and a half strikeouts. Like, like at plus one forty or something like that. And it's like, wow, that's, that's amazing because, you know, it should be minus 120 efficiently. Like, it is it just me or does it feel like even amongst the people that even get into sports betting, like, it's just not looked at. Like, there's so, like, there's so much who's going to win and not like my bet is based on the odds and I believe that the 
probability is higher or lower than those odds. Not that I think that that team's going to win or lose. Yeah. You, you're kind of like got two things there, the stigma and then the, like the knowledge gap. And but I, I think, think that, but I think for the, the general public, it's related because September 28th comes around. Kentucky is going to open up mobile sports betting. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be betting on sports. And you know, my, my, uh, my mother-in-law, her, I mean, my, my wife's uh, father who passed away was a degenerate gambler. So Sounds awesome. Her mother looks at me as like, like, oh, maybe I'll have a problem or something like that. It's like this is this is this is a woman that 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 goes and bets penny slots on a cruise that has like like an eighty percent payback, right? Which is like ridiculously bad, and doesn't understand. And even when I say that, like, doesn't understand like what that means. Like, like no, no, you in Las Vegas you could play machines that are like ninety seven percent payback, like. Your money at least goes further that way than you playing these garbage machines. But she just views it as gambling. Like she's, she would view it as if I was, if I was betting on football lines and whatever like that, it's like, Oh, it's gambling. And not that, well, I have a model and it says that this is the probability. The market says it to me, it's the age old thing of sports betting is essentially the same as options trading. Yet if you if you if if I if I told my mother in law, yeah I'm 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 a I'm an options trader on the on the stock market, like that's viewed as like oh oh, nice high class high class job and to be fair, I think more options traders are degenerates than fucking sports better. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, I think I think I think the majority of people think that way, like your mother in law. The um, I, th- I think you're giving a little too much credit to the people who think like understand poker is like oh that's a game of skill. It's definitely changed, but in 2006 or so, it was still like that. I was playing for a living then. Uh, anyone, most a lot of the people I talked to, especially older people, they didn't get it at all, and it was just as weird as talking about DFSs today or the last few years. So right. I don't think I. I I, I don't know. Like it's, it's still really niche, you know? And like, there's I mean, a reason for that TV, markets are so small. The thing about poker is that at least they see it on TV. Like, right. Like, oh, poker tournaments on TV. Like this is the credible. Yeah. You don't see, you don't see DFS. But or in 2006, that. it, that's only been that way for a few years. Right. So like before, like two, before 2003, they, they all would have thought you poker, if you're playing poker, they were, first of all, they were like, sure you are. Yeah, sure you are, buddy. You know, you know, I don't, I don't believe you're playing poker for a living. And then if they did, they'd be like, oh, well, he's going to lose everything. You know, all the time. Oh, you're going to lose it all. Like, yeah, all right. Okay. So, yeah, I think, I think it's, that's just the majority of people. And it's been, it's been that way. I mean, it was illegal, right? I mean, you had to go and you did this. You had to go into legal sports room, uh, poker rooms to play poker and sports betting. You had to go through a bookie back then, you know, and, and, uh, for the internet where it was ubiquitous, like um, you had to know somebody to even gamble. And then that guy, like you heard that guy beat up somebody, you know, cause they didn't pay him back. And then it, it did, ha- that did happen. So like, of course, you know, soccer moms are not going to understand, understand this world. And like, that's why prop bets are such a small market because the guys at the poker table are like, what's a prop bet, <laughs> you know, because it's their dumb money that makes the, uh, makes the main markets so liquid you know without them then nfl sides wouldn't be you couldn't get 25k down on an nfl side on a sunday morning without without the the dummies at the poker table so i mean i don't know if you can get that even if without the dummies anymore on the nfl side i think you can yeah yeah i think so yeah i wouldn't recommend it though <laughs> but are, are, are you are you doing more sports betting now than you uh, what, what's your mix as far as Sports betting related activities, non DFS versus DFS, as far as where your like your your volume is going. Well, we've been legal. Me, I'm, only, I'm only asking because for me, it's shifting way more and more yeah. towards props and sports betting. The only the only concern of mine is that, and I, and I mentioned this on Twitter that that when people are like, "Oh, the, the edge in DFS is going down," mm-hmm. and a lot more people are prop betting, sports betting. 
and there may be bigger edges there. The only thing is, is that in DFS, no matter, even if the edge is getting smaller, getting the money down is, you never have a problem with. But yeah. getting the money down, you know, September 28th comes around. Next thing you know, it's December 1st, and 17 of my 20 outs are gone. Like, and then I then then the game becomes 95, what, what it used to be back in the day of just finding accounts and getting partnerships. And it's like, that's not, I, I don't want that job. So you yeah. do you think that, well, for you personally, what's your mix now and what do you expect in the future? And do you feel like it's the same concern of, you got to play more DFS in general because the sports betting pot just may get smaller and smaller just based on limits. So we've been legal longer than, than you guys have, obviously you're just coming on right. now. So I've, I think it's been like four years now or so, maybe three years now. So when it first came on, I, I was sports betting quite a bit. Um, and then I got limited at bed rivers and points, um, bet probably points bet. Yes. And then I was like, I'm going to try to save these other accounts because if you just bet props and like, I was trying to be smart about it. Like I would bet, you know, the occasional side or total, um, you know, I don't know exactly. I'm sure there's, there's like a, a little dance you're supposed to play. That's, you know, the keep you alive the longest. I don't know what it is, but well, it feels like the dance doesn't matter. Cause I think they limit people that even are in charge. Right. They, they, and their, their net is too big. They're casting to get rid of all these sharps like that. Who knows? Like, I could have been a net loser. They, they might've blown money on me, you know? Um, but e either way, like my point. So then I, I scaled, well, you have to scale back. Right. Cause the only thing I could have beaten was props. Anyways, I'm not a professional sports better. And uh, so I scaled back with the plan of like building an app and like making some more um, automatic automated tools. So I could like kind of smash it all at once and then just go for all the books that are still here and just kind of attack it for six months. And I still haven't done that because I'm lazy and it takes work, but like that was kind of the, the idea. And so like now I'm just betting like the occasional prop that pops up, like ETR sends out an alert or um, right angle sports uh sends out some alerts and they're so just piggybacking on other people's origination piggybacking on some other yeah some other right and then catching uh, it before it moves obviously right right try to do if, yeah if, if i if i'm get to my computer and it's 30 minutes after the alert i'm not betting it you know what i mean you're dead after 30 seconds much less 30 minutes so just trying to squeak in a few of those before they move like i've probably got you know five or six season long um player prop bets going already on DraftKings stuff like that so, so, so for you, it sounds like nine, still 90% of your action is DFS. Is still DFS, yeah. And you don't plan on that change? No, well, I don't know. Like, I'm probably going to take a crack at sports betting a little bit more. I'm not sure. I'm not, I mean, my, my account might be worth more selling it and letting somebody, you know, like Rufus or, or uh, Spanky just bet my account for me. And then just take your percentage. Yeah. Cause like, yeah, like I could, I could probably get them some good bets for a while. Although now I'm saying this publicly now I'm probably not. Yeah. But. Do, do you think, do you think that your, that your decision on your path and your mix is dependent on what, like what, what, what your nut is? Because I think that matters a lot more. Cause I think there's a lot, there's a lot of people out there, uh, in sports betting, touting or whatever. I know you have no problem with touts, right? That you can't make a lot of money doing it. Like it's, it's not as easy to make a lot of money, but it's actually much easier to make a little money. And it's very rarely portrayed that way. So like on, on, on my shows, when it comes to prop betting or even like the prize picks underdog type of stuff, I'm like, with a decent size, with a decent enough bankroll, you could probably, it's not that difficult, even without promos, without bonuses, without any of that type of stuff, that if you, you could spend an hour or two a day and it's not with, it's realistic to make 20 grand for, for the year in, in 
baseball, football, whatever. Like, if that's your nut, if 20, 25 grand is your nut, like, I think that's absolutely doable. Now, if 250 grand is your nut, like, that's that's a little bit different. If 2.5 million is your nut, now we're, now we're talking about, now, now you need to spend more money on partnerships and accounts and more of that type of stuff. Is your is is it more the fact that your volume in DFS is so large that like the easy twenty to twenty five k a year type of nut isn't just isn't worth your work unless you can automate it so quickly that it just takes that amount just that amount of time. But for someone else, someone like me, where like my nut on the year between everything is like fifty to seventy five thousand. Like if I can make that, I'm happy, right? I'm. I'm living the life that I live and I get recurring info uh, income from all the content stuff that I do anyway. Mm -hmm. Like that just means that like, it feels like to me that I'm taking the money that I would have normally played in like DFS cash games and just put it into prop bets. Right. And it's like, this is less swings, you know, better ROI and a little bit more work, but, it's work at a different time. Like I'm doing more work in the morning than I am before lock. And then the more and more I do this, it's like, dude, if my path is to, is my nuts 50 K like what, why do I have to play this much DFS? Like, yeah. I don't think I need to, but like, yeah, you're, you're like, you're like Joey Kanish, you know, from rounders, like every little, <laughs> just, just grinding that edge Kanish. Um, I, I, you know, I've always, I've always, um, admired your, your kind of, um, strategy for low variance play, which I think like people gloss over that. Like it's nothing. And it's like, that's so big. You guys, like, if you gambled for as long as we have, like, you'd understand like how much pain and suffering that can cause. And it's just, if you could figure out a way to lower that. And I, I mean, you listen to my stuff. Like I preach like strategy like that all the time and like no one even ever picks up on it and i'm like i think that's like one of the most important things to do like portfolio balancing and stuff like that but like um but but i mean but the thing is that you have to sacrifice the i could win a million dollars in a day type like you're just you're not gonna but there's not but there's a middle ground because some people go oh well then you you, people that just play head-to-heads and double ups it's like that's the lowest variance it's also the highest skill because there's not many fish in that Bond anymore. Right, right, right. Right. So there's a balance. There's a balance. It's not like I, I'm, I'm still playing large field GPPs, but it's like I'm not playing 150 entries. And instead of playing NBA cash games for a, a 2.2 percent ROI, it's like, dude, I'm getting like six, seven percent on props compounded daily. Why the fuck aren't I doing that? And I'm not putting down like 20 percent of my bankroll. I'm still only putting down one, two percent. Like. There's a give and take. I think people people look at it too far on the spectrum of like either you're a nit or you're going yeah. for gold. And there really is a balance between the, even you. There's a balance between the two. Sure. I, I, I like I get where you're like the the going for the two percent props and stuff like that. Like for a lot of people, though, they don't have your base of skills that you already have a, accumulated over time and they have to figure out how to get that one or two percent and that's like a lot of work to then get limited you know or like right. it's not dfs like you could easily be banned on all these sites doing props even the new you know side ones so like i it makes it, i could understand someone being like hesitating going down that path when they don't know where to look and then how to price props and all that stuff and then they don't know how to automate anything. And so it's a lot of time and effort. Like, so for me, like you said already, like if I could automate it and it's like, so like when you do your thing at midnight or whatever, I just press a button and then I go to bed, you know, and right. you're sitting there for another hour or two, then I would, then I would do it. But like what I, what I would rather be part of if, if I went down the sports betting Avenue is a group. Like, I think I'd be more valuable as like a group member with like, coming up with models and coding, um, maybe finding accounts, you know, through other people. So you'd want to be part of a syndicate. Yeah. I think I'd rather be part of a new syndicate. So why, why don't you, why don't you have a lull syndicate? 
Um, well, you know, and also I've talked about this before. Like, I think you could do like a cool crypto one too. Like you could in incorporate. Oh, well, you know, I'm at once you said the word crypto. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but like you could do like smart contracts and stuff through it. And so you don't need a lawyer and like, who's doing lawyers with this type of thing. You could, but, um, uh, uh like, and I just like, like you might be able to keep accounts more honest that way too, that you, that you buy and utilize through smart contracts on, on a blockchain. That's the, this is the type of stuff that I just, this is not the, what I wanted to do for a living. But when you're doing it in a group, it's slightly, you know, like that wouldn't be your responsibility. Like you're, I don't know what yours would be. So I need group. to find someone that really loves partnerships and accounts. Right. Like, yeah. And truthfully, they're the most valuable, truthfully, they're the most valuable person on the team. Probably. Yeah, probably. Um, but yeah, like, like something like that would be like, I wouldn't want to do the account thing either. So like, I agree with you, but like being on my own in the sports betting world just sounds so lonely and boring. And, um, well, that's why you have shows and you talk about it. Yeah. I isn't guess. That I mean, just talking about Brian, it, you're just asking to get banned. Yeah. But Brian, isn't that the reason why you started doing Sure. videos or whatever because you were lonely and you just even if you're giving away edge or whatever and of course my claim is always 95 percent of the people watching aren't gonna fucking do it anyway <laughs> like it doesn't even matter uh, and of course you have the whole thing of all five percent turn into monsters and i'm dead but i mean you did you you do a show every week because so you're not you view it as a it's a social thing yeah so, so why can't the same be the in the right sport? Word. Why can't you just think the same way with the sports betting? But I understand. See, I understand your perspective when it comes to content. When it comes to picks, like at at all the stuff that I do at at Roto Grinders, like a lot of other people there have transitioned into doing more content on scores and odds and picks and stuff like that. But like to me, like I'm grinding. Like I'm if I. I'm getting down before I tell anyone else, right? And by the time I tell anyone, the, the number probably moves. So, like, to me, I don't view content to be, like, what the fuck can I do, right? Because either I'm betting it or I'm telling someone to bet on it. I'm making the money by betting it. So, to me, my value is more in education on, like, educating people, like, on just basic math and statistics. I'm like, like, dude, did... Here's the difference between if you got minus 112 versus minus 108 on a line for 365 days, how much more money would you have? You know, like that type of stuff. Like you don't have to be long. You don't have to. I mean, I, it still comes down to the question that you didn't ask the answer about your nut. Like you're, I mean, it's not the break even point, but I'm assuming that I I'm much more humble on what I'm looking to make. Hmm. doing all of this and you'd like to make you you don't mind taking on much more risk that's part of it. a lot more money that's definitely part of it yeah uh, and yeah my risk tolerance is 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 broken um <laughs> anyone who plays dfs for a living i mean i mean these edges are so small now this is another topic but like the edges are so small now that like even having an edge might not be good enough because it's just so swingy you might never achieve that edge if you're only getting if you only got like two three percent edge or one percent edge it just might not be worth playing DFS, but like, just like for me, like personally, you know, obviously everyone has their own thoughts is like, I don't, I don't think you pick what you're into. Like I was, you know, I'm not a sports fan anymore. I used to be a sports fan. It, it just, all, it, it just happened. Or something? <laughs> no, it's just <laughs> deterministic, you know, philosophy worldview of, you know, all the way back to the big bang, like whatever, um, you don't really control any of these things. They kind of just, what you're into is just, you don't. Know, I don't just go like, I'm just going to be an awesome pickleball player, right? I'm just going to play pickleball all the time. There's a bunch of things that, even if you did end up becoming an awesome pickleball player who played all the time, there's a bunch of things that led up to that. And so like, I, I'm just not interested in being a sports better right now. And, um, and it's, and it's not like something I can control where like tomorrow I'm going to be like, no, nope, that's it. I'm flipping the switch. I'm going to be excited to sports bet and come up with ideas and tools and blah, blah, blah to spend hours and hours betting sports. So like, that's why I'm not 
into it. I'm just saying if I was going to transition to it and I did get the bug. So like, like guitar is a perfect example for me. Like I used to be a guitar teacher and uh, through college and um, I got in a car accident and ripped my thumb off and they attached it, but it like doesn't bend right here. And I was kind of done playing guitar anyways. This is 2006. So like um, I just didn't play guitar for uh, 18 years or something after that. But then I just, for some reason, I got the bug again about like eight months ago and I play guitar constantly. And that's why I got that new chair I told you about mm -hmm. because it's more suitable to play a guitar in. Um, but I don't control any of that. I didn't want, and like when I was a kid, my parents were begging me to pick up an instrument, but I didn't want to. I didn't start playing until I was uh, 16. You know, like it, it's, it, there's no rhyme or reason. It just happens through a bunch of random interactions and genes and things that, that that go back hundreds of thousands of years and so like i don't think you like you can pick up this passion i think it just it just sort of happens so for me that's why i'm not going full bore into sports betting i'm just not into it right now but maybe i will be and if i was gonna do it this i think i'd be more interested in the syndicate model so like i feel like etr is kind of like a syndicate they're just doing it more publicly so like instead of hiring all the accounts getting all the accounts and then betting, you know, 500 bets at once, they just put it on their, put it on their, right. Discord. And then they're just getting a guaranteed and they get a guarantee 120 right. bucks or whatever. I don't know what their fee is for the, for the year. Um, which, you know, so like I would be fine with that model too, actually, maybe that would be something I'd want to do, but one of those two, because like you said, like I'd rather it be uh, a social um, the, the social piece of it. And I don't want to be the only guy again. You know what I mean? Like poker or DFS in the beginning. I mean, poker, well, poker, if you play online. Yeah. Poker, if you play online, right. like yeah. I've been playing, I've been playing live and Brian, let me tell you like playing live poker. I mean, or play, I mean, maybe, maybe it's more live. Like after you've played DFS for seven years, regularly seven eight uh, coming up on eight years and i used to play poker back when you played poker. i mean we both did the same the same path you got especially with that tweet with the world series of poker like the payout for the main event yeah. did you see that with the 12 yeah, yeah, million yeah. up top and whatever yeah and then i what joked around and i looked and i like wow what a flat payout structure right right i mean because we're dfs is, is higher rake and top more top heavy that i went back to playing when i played live poker now, I'm just amazed at how low variance it is. And when we played poker back in the day, it was high. It was like, wow, po the swings in poker are so Ooh. dramatic. And then after playing DFS for this long, going back to poker feels like. Cares. Right. It almost feels like, oh, I'm an 80-20. Like, I, dude, in DFS, you could never get in as an 80-20. Oh, like, that, yeah. That, like, yeah, I'm a 90-10 and I lose. Like, right. on a two-outer. Oh, well, but like, dude, DFS, you never get in as a 90. Like, like right. it's the type, I, I explained it to one per, one person. In poker, Brian, ace-king versus deuces, right? What do, we, what do poker people consider that? A coin flip, right? Yeah. But it isn't. The deuces, deuces are 50, a 52, yeah. a 52 yeah. percent favorite. That's the old slim, Amarillo slim scam. Jack-10, ace-king, deuces, remember? Right. Anyway, right. But the thing is, like the pot, the pot, the pair against the two over cards is looked at in poker by poker players as it's a flip. Yet if you tell a DFS player that you have a 52 48, it's right. like if like that's kind of the edges that we're that, like, like, dude, we're compounding the maybe not 52, but it's like we're looking at 58 42s. We're looking at we're we're basically playing like ace eight versus yeah, versus king ten. And going, well, I got ace eight. And then my opponent has king ten. A poker player would look at you and go, That isn't that big of a favor. Like, like, right. like that you're 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 putting down so much money in those spots. It's like in poker, you could put down money at, and get your opponent in really bad spots. But in DFS, those are the spots. It's more like PLO. PLO oh, on yeah. steroids. Right. Right. You never like you never more than a 60% yeah. favor over almost anyone. Yep. I mean, the point I made earlier, people don't take uh seriously and i don't think about it very much 
But if you have like your 52-48, if you had, let's say, you have a 4% edge in your 150 set, which is pretty good, actually. That's You're probably one of the best players nowadays. Um, if with the swings as huge as they are in DFS, like you could go broke, you know, 10 times before becoming this, uh, you know, before, before becoming rich, like, cause the swings are so, so huge, like 4%, you know, maybe that's somewhere around there, maybe one, 2% for sure. But like, that's the example I always give is like the lottery. Like when it rolls over so much, there's actually a slight edge for every ticket you buy. Not much, but it's a, it's a plus EV bet, but even Elon Musk couldn't afford it if he was playing proper bankroll management because he would eventually go broke and he'd have to sell Tesla before he hit, hit the lottery. Right. Cause it, it takes some, so if he could live forever or if he just would buy all the tickets every time, I don't know how either, whichever would go first, but it's just an analogy. And DFS is way more close to that than it is Texas Hold'em, no limit Texas Hold'em or limit Texas Hold'em. Uh, in terms of the variance. So when your variance is huge, it's like, yeah, sure. My lottery ticket is plus EV, but uh, at a certain point, is it worth, is it worth betting compared to my bankroll? And I think that's kind of the world we're living in with DFS right now. But do you think that, that the biggest determination on your edge is more so how many I I'm, I'm, I'm on the, cause I, I've looked at this year CSVs from MLB, from NBA, from NFL. And to me, the determination is more so on how many bad players are still left and less on how many good players exist. Like to me, like I, I found with my rudimentary skills that the, like if I were to build a 150 set in MLB tonight against your 150 set, I don't think our portfolios would be dramatically different in ROI. Yours probably would end up being a little bit better, right? I'm willing to at least admit that. But against the the difference between me, you, and you to cow and list off all the 150 Alex and everyone, like we're basically all competing against like the bulk that's left over from the bad lineups. And Although you would like to have more than your fair share than Alex or Utica or whoever, at the end of the day, if there wasn't for the 20% of bad lineups, like no one could make money. It, it's just a matter of how it's, it's now you're just, I think more people consider GPPs like they're trying to like, how do I get better than brick 75? And don't think in terms of, let me make sure there's enough bad lineups in here that it's worth it to play at all. That even if we, like you said, there's enough bad lineups that there's this small 2% edge that could be shared amongst all these people. And maybe you have 2.6% and I have 1.4%, but the edge is still so small that is it worth it to, to put down three grand to max enter this contest and go through those swings? But there are also, there are some, especially during NFL season, there are some contests where the amount of negative EV lineups and that are like 4x, 5x the rake in the contest. Like those are like, oh, now the pie is so much bigger that I don't have to, I don't have to be better than Chipotle addict. I just have to have yeah. lineups that aren't part of the bad lineups. Deep, that I don't think people thought think of that as much when really that's the reason why everyone had an edge in 2013 is because like 70% of the field were fucking bad lineups. I mean, like right. no one knew how to right, play. Right, right, right. Right. So now once we get down to like there being less bad lineups in the rake, like we're starting to get into territory where no one could make a make a profit anymore. I don't think we're there, but I think too many people focus on how do I get to be good like Brian Hooper instead of how do I just find the contests that have the least least the weakest players and the most bad lineups and then just build competent lineups regardless of like Oh, well, maybe these are a little too high owned. Well, maybe these are a little too good. Like now you're, you're trying to get the extra 1% there, but really the main point of the game is to right. find, find the contest with shitty lineups in it. Yeah. If, if, especially if you're like starting out or building bankroll, all those skills are way more important than 
trying to beat Utica. Um, I, I kind of group it into three, like three buckets is pretty, it's probably about right. We got the, the 20% that you're talking about. They're just like dead money. And then there's like in between, right? Average. And then like the 150 years, right? Or like the, the full timers, whatever you want to call it. And I would say all three buckets have gotten significantly sharper since 2015. Um, and so it's a problem at every level. So like even the middle guys, they're now using like stochastics lineup generator or or they or or they or, or they have decent projections where they didn't even have projections before you know and or they're getting an optimizer that's free now you know like um or they or or they're just going by someone's top plays and the top plays are obviously top projected players anyway i mean like it's yeah. the type of thing at roto grinders where i tell people it's like like, sure, you can read an article that has all the top plays and the reasons for them, but if you go to lineup HQ and just like sort by the port per dollar column or something, <laughs> It'll be like dead. it's gonna be those people. I mean, like it's so like, that if you want to do it quicker, there's there's an easier way of doing it. So that took the bot like a bottom 20% guys was probably more like but 40% back then, put them up into the middle section, which stinks because that's money from out of your pocket. And then a lot of like 150 ers who probably shouldn't have been doing 150 also got better in that time and survived and learned and got better or they're using these new tools there's also there's also sims now multiple sims it sounds like that you could um that you could use at various sites that are you know increasing their edge or decreasing their their shitty amount of shitty lineups you know so even at the top it's getting harder and like you could just here here's a dead giveaway jordan this is just uh, you know look at all the awesome good players who know either no longer play or have scaled back their play or have limited the amount of sports they've played almost all yeah, dude i'm one of them right yeah like oh i mean but like no offense not me or you like right alex you to cow says he's thinking about retiring ricky d does, i don't think he's playing baseball anymore De gave up nba I mean, even even the Burrito Brothers, like they've scaled back. They play; they'll play football, but and I, not, I, we're not even talking OGs, right? We're not even talking. Right. Uh, what what's his name? Uh, who are the who are the the the, the we're not talking about like CSU or and, anyone like yeah, that. yeah yeah the the guy the, the, the heel Max Daldry uh right what yeah, did he change his, uh, what did he change his name to? Why am I blanking? Say heel sued S sued. Really? Thank you. Yeah, not even those guys. I'm talking like the actually good guys, <laughs> like the, right. the guys in the, like the last five years or so. Like um, the vast majority of them, and if and you could tell too if they're not if they're people if they're not running hot, <laughs> they're definitely scaling back their play. So like, I think that's just like all you need to know. Smart, good people playing a lot less. Uh, the games are just super sharp. But do you also think? But go getting to your your tweet that you had, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago that, you know, you said here, MLB DFS is getting pretty sharp. Most nights, there were only a handful of the 150 maxers that are plus EV. Mm -hmm. Last night, there were only 11. Some nights, there were even less. And this is according to the stochastic post-contest results, sim based on the actual field. And obviously, they're based on the stochastic projections, which, right. I mean, you, you use, but it doesn't mean that it's gospel. I, I don't use them, but... Right. But the thing is, is that my my... My my theory the whole time, not necessarily the whole. The more it it's it goes against the notion that of course we see the the troll notion. You have 150 lineups, you can cover all the combinations, and you can win everything and whatever like that. Yeah, it goes against the fundamental concept that that as you play more lineups, the ROI of your portfolio has to go down because you can't capture the same equity with every lineup. So like lineup number one, like I, 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 I used, I used the example on the pregame show a couple of weeks ago of like a 10 man contest, right? We used the little examples, right? This is something that you would do in your previous videos. You used to have a series or whatever in Excel mm -hmm. and it's a 10 man contest. And we're going to forget about rake. It's rake free. And it's a 50, 30, 20 payout top three, right? 10 man contest. And you can put in as many entries as you want. Right. So you can play all 10 if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, if you played $10, right, for one entry, the maximum amount of equity you could have in the contest is 50 bucks, right? First place. If you put in two entries, 
The maximum of of equity you could have in the contest is $80. Mm -hmm. Divide that by two, the average would be 40 bucks each in max equity between each lineup. And then if you do the third one, you're playing 30 bucks and the max equity you could have is, is a hundred dollars, which is like 33 bucks. If you five entries for 50 bucks, it doesn't increase your equity because there's no more payout spots. That, that, that is what portfolio theory is in DFS that as you add more lineups to your portfolio, your ROI has to mathematically go down and you need to build even better lineups on average to make up for the loss. Cause your first, your first lineup could only win a hundred thousand. Your second lineup could only win 40,000. Your third, if you, if, cause you're competing against your own lineups also, but you're paying the same amount per lineup. So isn't there theoretically a point in which based on the lineups that are already in the contest and the strength of those lineups, isn't there a theoretical point where you can't get your portfolio can't increase your ROI. There's a point. There's a, so it depends on the slate depends on the contest, but there's a theoretical point where 83 lineups that you personally can't build an 84th lineup that makes you a higher ROI mm-hmm. or lowers your very, that does something positive for you that at that point you should be cutting it off on a slate on the Millie maker, where there's so many bad lineups in NFL. Maybe it'd be like, you know, dude, if I could build 700 lineups, I'd do it. Right. But isn't there, there has to be because of the dynamics that your lineups are competing against one another. There has to be a way to see yeah. if you could simulate how many lineups that could possibly be made in a portfolio that if you go past there, that you're really not, you're not gaining, you're not, you're, it's going to only be negative for you. Sure. I'm sure that I'm sure that's right. Like, yeah, you can't like if you put in like eight thousand lineups into a fifteen thousand person GPP, I doubt that that makes you money in the long run. Those extra however many lineups, right? You'll win more often, but you'll yeah you'll you'll lose money in the process. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure there's because you'd be taking slots away from bad players. You would be taking away slots from 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 dead money. So yeah, I'm I'm sure that's. That's probably right. But but the pragmatic, the problem with that, however, and we had a conversation on Twitter about it, is that when you build your 150 lineups, like you're not, which, if I said that you shouldn't be playing more than 83 lineups, would right. you be able to tell which 83 lineups you should play out of your 150? Probably not. No. I mean, I bet I could get it closer than people think. But yeah, it would, it would, um, maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. I think, but the point, the overall point I'm making is that if the edges are going down, if you say, oh, 2% or whatever like that, wouldn't it be make, make more sense from a variance standpoint? So thinking more in the Joey Kanish mindset that you could have a, you could, what you, you would be be better off playing instead of playing 150, just playing 35, playing what I mean, and make the best 35 exploitatively that you can. Like that would be, that would make you as much money as playing 150 and lower the swings that you would have and then be able to spread the rest of your volume out. Yeah. Like, like the, basically that's the concept that, I mean, that's the concept I've lived by yeah. from the beginning. Cause even, I mean, I rarely play 150 dude. I, I played large field GPPs for a long time, binked at NBA and I play 40 lineups and 20 lineups and 60 lineups and, I've you don't have to play 150. Yeah, I've considered it. I mean, I do that in the high stakes. I don't max the high stakes. I mean, sometimes, but not not always. Um, because, like, I doubt they're making 13 plus CV lineups. A lot of these, a lot of these. Although there's not many people who do 13 anymore. Do the full or whatever it is that day. Right. Um, there's only a couple. But, but isn't that the sign that. that my that my point has to be have to have a bunch of merit when. If you're not willing to put in seventy eight thousand dollars worth of lineups in some high states, like yeah. okay, there is a point where bankroll management right. and variance control come. It's just that at the at the at the fifteen dollar level, you know, playing twenty two fifty is like okay. What playing the difference between playing fifteen hundred dollars worth of entries and twenty two hundred dollar entries, like you're already playing five figures worth of entries. So like, right? Who cares right. if the ex the other seventy lineups really? Like it would have been better if I didn't play those lineups. The like, thing that, 
what I've noticed through the Sims is the difference is how um, diverse you want to make your portfolio. If you do the old school kind of way of a 150 set with one unique, and if you win, you take first, second, fourth, eighth, ninth, tenth, you know what I mean? If you do that, if you make if you know how to make plus EV lineups or you have a process that generally speaking, you're plus EV and you do like one unique and all the lineups are very similar. You could probably get your whole phone 50 plus EV a lot easier, but also your swings are going to be ridiculous. Your swings I mean, are going to be in, in, in massive. So like, I like playing less swingy and trying to build a portfolio from that way. But then when you go through these post lock Sims, it's going to show you that your 150 is not as good. And part of that is because, you know, like I don't use Osmos projections. So um, when I'm high on their list, I, um, and it's a good sign for me because I'm like, I'm not even using their stuff. So I'm doing something right. If it's showing plus EV in their 150 set where they're post lock Sims. But like, I've noticed like if, if like for some reason, I'm just heavy on one, obvious team or something my roi will go up in their sims and in others and so like <laughs> like i don't you have to like you have to find some like balance there and i just i mean i think it's just tough to get a whole 150 plus ev now and and also like you know like if their projections are wrong or cardies are wrong or you know one of them's right or one of them's wrong or somebody else's or you make your own it's going to show it's going to show different numbers too, but it should show about the same amount of people being plus EV, like somewhere relatively. And plus EV is also relative too, because like I was trying to point out in that post, I think in the follow up to you that I had in there, like a lot of them are 0.01% plus EV, 0.5% plus EV. Like you might as well be negative EV at that point. The game's so swingy. So it's like, you know, people who are like 2% or higher, on any given night, like you could probably expect to make some money. Um, and, but like, so like that number is dwindling so much that. Is this, just, we just talked about MLB though. I think it's every sport. Um, there, that logic holds true with any sport. Cause usually there is just like specific combos or players or stacks or however you want to call it, call it that are just the good ones that day. And so like, if they're, if you just add more of them. So like if you, you know, from an optimizer standpoint, if you put like six uniques, it's going to drop the, you know, your, your Kansas city Royal stack from 25 down to 12 or something like that. Right. But if you scale that to one unique, it's going to put them up to 40% or something. And it's going right. to be like, Oh, you, you were smart. You played a whole bunch of Kansas city, but in reality, you don't want to, you don't want to be that that uh have that much variance so like you well, that, you, well that's the difference between exploit like i play exploitatively in that way where i'm not doing it i'm not using automation or running simulations where i want to play more of what the teams that i believe are under owned for their projection and less of the teams that are over owned for their projection but there is a point where the more lineups that i play the more that i have incentive from a portfolio management perspective, variance control perspective of, yeah, that these, these Rockies, these, these, these core stacks are low, are low EV are like, are not, are not the best to play. We'd be better to play the, the shit Royal stacks and be better to play the, this 10% on pitcher or whatever. But in 40 lineups, like if I was playing three lineups, I'd say, fuck it. I'm fa like, yeah. I ain't playing. I ain't, I ain't playing the chalk core stack, yeah. but in 150 lineups, I'd be like, I'll play 10 of them. So I, so I don't have this and obviously play 10 that are contrarian enough that I'm not like sharing shit with half the fucking field, but that only comes into play because you're doing it for the sake of your bankroll management. And the more percentage of your bankroll that you're playing, the more likely you should be doing that. So I always advise people that it sounds counterintuitive. And this is one of the edges in the single entry three max type of contest. I go, when you're playing only one to three lineups, like dude, fucking fade cores, dude, fucking don't play the 70% on pitcher. I mean, like, like 
You don't need to. Like, are you playing three lineups and are you playing less than 1% of your bankroll? And if you're play the highest EV lineups like that. But if you tell me you're, I'm playing 5% of my bankroll and 150 lineups, it's like, you better fucking play some core stacks in the 70% pitcher. <laughs> because if you don't, it's going to hit it often enough that next thing you know, two months from now, 80% of your bankroll is gone. Like, I, yeah. I don't think enough people talk about that. They almost view it the opposite. They think because they have 150, it's like, well, I'll just make a whole bunch of combos of things that aren't the chalk. Right. And it's like, no, I think you need to play more chalk because every lineup that you add to your portfolio naturally yeah. lowers your EV because you're competing against your own lineups. And when you're pulling, pulling one lineup, dude, it only represents like so little of your bankroll. Why not? If there's a, if there's a lineup out there that has a 40% ROI, why the fuck are you bothering with these 11% ROI lineups that are, that are, they're sharing, they're chalky. Just play the fucking one fucking have grow some balls and stack against the highest own pitcher and like you, yeah you, you understand you understand you understand that like i see what you're saying but right. the, that's a, from a hand builder's perspective so for me it doesn't matter like i just, like your computer just tells you what to do and just you walk away right <laughs> i walk away so like i i don't i don't want to if it's like you play cores then i play cores if it doesn't like it so like on, on the on the on the on the three max or whatever my advice is always just make sure your two teams, if you're going to do two in there, make sure they're different from each other. You know, a decent amount. Because you want, if you're hand building, especially, you know, just because, and you want them decent, if especially when, if they're like uncorrelated. Baseball's the easiest one where you could, if you take a pit, if you take Scherzer and then in your first lineup, well, maybe take the stack that's playing against Scherzer in your second one. Not always, but like, or if it's somebody who's like more mid middling, you know, and the other stack could, more likely go off. Um, that's a nice little pair. Assuming this is a plus EV, they're both, you know, right. your plus EV. But, but I think that the number one determination is instead is how much are you playing? Like how, like, like there's a big difference between uh, playing a 555. I'm playing, I, let's say you have a $5,000 bankroll and you're mm -hmm. playing three entries into the 555. I'm going to stop. I'm going to play 1% on players is like, dramatically horrible even if those lineups are the highest ev lineups because dude you're playing 30 percent of your bankroll on well yeah like My. like but to me that's the determination if someone told me like i'm uh, if someone told me that they're they're playing uh the 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 20 max right 20 max three dollar 20 max and they have a five hundred thousand dollar bankroll and they're just playing 60 bucks into the 20 max like you what variance control do you need? Like, dude, play the 20 highest EV lineups, even if it's like, if it's shit that, like, you're most like, like, nine out of 10 days, you're losing all your money. Like, you're not even getting any back. You're not getting any of your 60. But you're, you're fucking, you're, but if those, if your simulations tell you that these are the 20 highest EV lineups, even if they're 1v1s of each other, like, you're in much more of a position overall because, like, it's like that lottery example of like, oh, the lottery has a 2% edge, but no one has the big enough bankroll in order to like realistically profit from it. But let's say you did. Let's say, I mean, let's say it's not the Powerball. Let's say it's, you know, the standard three, you know, pick three number type of lottery type of thing where there's only a thousand combinations. Like if you had, a, if you had a 5% edge there, it's like, well, go and buy all the numbers for, you know, spend, spend five grand and buy all the numbers. You're guaranteed. Like if you have, if you have five hundred thousand dollars, you'd be making tons of money. To, it seems like no one puts it into the perspective of like your portfolio management should be directly related to your bankroll management. Yeah, definitely. The um, and and I my sim does, and I'm assuming almost everyone else's sims. They assume you have an endless bankroll and uh, and and proceed accordingly to that. So. Uh, that's definitely a concern you should always think about. But just talking about just pure ROI, and if you want to score high in those post-lock simulators, you would just do what it says, but then just do the least amount of variance and uniques or however you want to describe it as possible. And that would be one way to to get to your 35 lineups with make sure that like guaranteeing they're all plus EV right. is you do your sim process 
you do the least amount of uniques possible and then cut it in half or whatever. And then those probably all should be plus EV, but they're all going to be very similar. Not all of them. There'll be some outliers. Right. But the yeah. less lineups that you play, the more like the the more the 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 more risk you're. It basically comes down to the less lineups you play, the more risk you should be willing to take on. Um. Well, no, I'm just saying just to score high in a post. Right. Oh, oh, okay. Him. All right. right. But you but you you make that out as if like scoring high in the post contact sim is not the be all end all. Um, no, yeah, I'm saying it's probably not because there is portfolio management and you're assuming your projections are accurate and they're oftentimes not. And Sims have the same problem that optimizers have just from a different vantage point. So like an optimizer, if you t throw in there with two players, one's projected for 9.5 points and the other guy's projected for 9.3 points. It's going to give you the 9.5 point guy every single time until for some reason it over it overrides him without randomness or anything. And even with randomness, it's going to still give you that 9.5 guy. Cause that's what it's an optimizing for those numbers. Right. And simulators do the same thing. So they're looking at however you're, you're doing your simulation. Uh, there's a billion different ways to do it, but it also like says no like this is what is very this is what's going to happen is otani's going to get this range of points and um and so like it's going to say the Kansas City stack is your highest ev lineup even though maybe like cardi's numbers aren't taking into account everything that day that needs to be done or stochastics not up to date or whatever reason so like Throwing and then, like we talked about too, having this, this, this uh, negative correlation balance, just lowers your your variance. So, like, that's how I play. I mean, but if like the argument on Twitter of like, can you make seventy plus EV lineups? Like, I think you probably could get really close to every all of them being plus EV and cutting it off wherever by doing that run your Sam, no uniques at all. And then, and then cutting in half just to be safe. Right. But the problem is, is that you're very, that your swings are going to be absurd. You'll definitely have variance. Yeah. And you're, and you're relying on your projection source or whatever you're doing, which I mean, I mean, which isn't the worst thing in the world because like, you know, you're, you're assuming those are right or mostly right. So it's not a bad gamble to, to just assume you're, you're dead on accurate and you're, and you're not, you're risking half the amount of money. Right. Well, that, well, that's that, that's kind of the point that I'm making is yeah. that that you don't you don't have to be as at you don't have to be as accurate. Yeah, I'm just saying though, like if you did the full 150, but you had a bunch of uh, diversity amongst your portfolio, or you did 70, but it was no diversity, like your long term risk like profile might be identical or right. worse. I mean, right? Who's to say? I mean, I mean, obviously you could you could test this and 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 figure it out, but. Um, yeah, but again, like we're 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 commingling a lot of thoughts here. So like, just the idea of getting good in those ROI sims or cutting off a certain point, I think you could probably do it. That would be the way I would do it. And um, if you just want to score high in those, like that's the strategy you want to do. I guess it's just your kind of two different uh, strategies, really. I think both are viable. How about how about in sports like MMA? Or like showdown. Did you see my tweet yesterday? I said, uh, "Do you?" Oh yeah, the opta did. Do you include one? It was a free. It was a basically a frequency question. It was what? It was a frequency question. Even though I don't, I just don't like. I didn't like the 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 word opt. I I don't like the word optimal in the tweet. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up. Uh, you basically you basically asked, and this was before the MMA slate or something. Yeah, right. It was like do uh, you playing fighter. It was a poll. Playing yeah. all fighters at least once in your yeah. 150 set on an average MMA slate is optimal. And I just don't like the word optimal there because okay. Like like it there's no such thing as like I was using it as like the colloquial G GTO is this like the best way. Right. It honest in, in a in a 150 set on, on an average MMA slate, you're free. I mean, Nerdy Tanner would probably attest to this that. There's rarely ever going to be a fighter that has such a little shot at, at being in the winning lineup mm -hmm. that he that he shouldn't be in less than 
what 0.75 percent of your of total line i mean essentially what you're saying here is that you know one out of 150 is is what 0.75 percent of your portfolio so unless you believe a fighter is should not be owned at least 0.75 percent of the time he should be in one one of at least one of your lines yeah, and I said average slate too. So right. that that slate that you described with nerdy, where there's some guy who's just so bad he shouldn't be in any laps. It wouldn't be on an average slate. Right, right. That's what I'm saying. It's like yeah. it's, it's very rare that that happens. That yeah. That so day. obviously, I yeah, my answer is definitely yes. And it's interesting. It was like 75 percent no. But it depends on what you mean by optimal. I don't know. That's I think I think optimal makes. Like makes perfect sense there. Like, what word would you have used? No, but I I don't think that's the. But no, the thing is, is that I'm not sure if that's your goal. Well, what's your well? What? What? what <laughs> go ahead. What? What? what, 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 what the, would the question be different? So let's say you have 150 set because yeah. we talked about this before with the MLB stuff. Uh huh. Of like the unique. Uh, there's there's lineups that are high ROI and it may only be one off from each other. You may be playing 98% of the Kansas city Royals, right? Like that type of thing. Uh, from a frequency standpoint, if you were going to play GTO and uh, let's say, let, let's use to make the numbers easy, a hundred lineups, right? And GTO that this guy should be in 18% of lineups frequency. He should be 18% owned. You should from a, to not be exploited optimally you would play 18 percent of that person right right you'd be this would be more on the lineup level yeah, I, I didn't mean it that way right I, no but I, that's what i thought you meant it that way. okay but i was that, I, that, to me, I that's still am means. under the assumption that everyone thinks gto just means the best what i should have said was like default standard style or default so like in 150 set on an average slate by default you should assume you're going to have at least one fighter in every and in, in your no, in, no, I, I would, I would agree with you, but you don't have, but it's not necessarily optimal. No, I, I think, I think on an average slate, it, it's going to be optimal. Yeah, I think every single time on an average slate, you're going to have at least one fighter from every lineup. But that that may not, not be the highest ROI portfolio. No, I'm saying in the highest ROI portfolio possible, GTO everything on an average slate. Oh, okay, so you're, you're going to have one fighter from each fight in 150 lineups. I think if it was 100 lineups, that might not be true. But in 150, what, I think what, gonna, what does the 50 lineups matter? I think it because you you wouldn't be able to get enough combinations to make some of these guys. No, no, no. Okay. The, here's here, here's my re rebuttal to this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use an extreme example. Okay? Extreme example. So let's let's call it a, a let's call it a let's you, you want to use the 10 man contest to make it easy. I don't you do whatever you want. <laughs> okay. So it's a 10 man contest. Uh-huh. Right. Uh or we can say it's a hundred man, whatever. Because obviously sure. we have to do multiple, like you're playing a hundred lineups. Okay. Let's call it a large field. It's a hundred thousand entries, whatever. Uh if there was one fighter that was outside of your lineups, one hundred percent owned. So basically yeah. every lineup has. Whatever fight, it could be whatever right. fight. It doesn't matter. Doesn't like, can I stop you? That's not an average slate. Well, of course, but I'm trying, I'm not saying that. that. Yeah, but you can give me an extreme example where, of course, you wouldn't put the fighter in the line. No, but there's a lot. But on an average, there. average slate, it will, you should have, a, you should, you should pro almost definitely, in my opinion, have one in every, out of every fight. So, so you're, the point that I'm trying to make, I'm, I may end up agreeing with you. Mm -hmm. You haven't let me get to the point. <laughs> well, because your first example was 100. Like that well, never well, happens. Oh, well, only only to show to show the disparity of like right, if, let's not average. It's not an average slate. Okay. Okay. Let's use then I'll, I'll agree with you. Right. So you basically like if you played 150 lineups that didn't contain that wildly overowned fighter. Right. Your your line your lineup set would be a that much higher sense. ROI. Yeah, right. but that's not average. Right. So you're, but you're, you're basically saying on an average MMA slate, they will never be a fighter that is so overowned. No, that, yeah, on an average can, slate, yeah. On an, okay, then then I agree with you. Then I, right. that's the only point I was going to make is that yeah, there of there course, may be there's extreme examples. Right. Yeah, where the guy was 100 percent owned, uh, and and he's not good for some reason. <laughs> like clearly, you shouldn't have that guy. Yeah, but there are also some slates where there's a guy that's 
40% owned that I think efficiently should only be 12% owned. Like they're, but yeah, even I've, at I've that never point, had, never, no sim has ever shown me on an average slate guys, 40% right. owned where I have zero. Right. But there, even, like, even, but even what I'm saying, what I'm guys saying are is like even 5% owned. Right. Like I, I, uh, occasionally when they're 2% owned, but that's pretty rare. Right. That they're get down to that. So that's not an average slate. Right. And and like even 65% or higher is not an average slate. They rarely ever get that high. Right. You so really like, get the, you're at the mispr- We've had slates where the, you know, $7,100 guy is now a minus 500 favorite because right. of a replacement. And even those guys don't even get to 70%. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So like, yeah, the examples you would give that are clear cut where it's like, no, it's not every time. It's like, well, that's not what I'm saying every time. I'm just saying on an average slate. But the, and, and the reason I asked it was I was like, I wonder if people don't know this because like if to me, it's just, it, it's just so obvious. Cause I do, I do, I've, I, I've played an MMA slate for how many times in a row for years now. Mm-hmm. And it's just every single time I'm just looking at these shitty guys, like, okay, how much of the shitty guys am I getting to this time? Mm-hmm. There's never any, I'm getting zero, you know, like uh, on an average slate again. And there's never any, the guy who's 50% owned, I'm getting zero. It never happens. Right. Like this past slate, I was running lineups and I'm getting like 25, 30% of Basil Hafez, the biggest underdog. Yeah, I, I wish I had my. Oh wait, actually, I do have my. Uh, the thing is, is that I'm not playing 150 lineups, so I got rid of a lot. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, that's why I said yeah. If you cut down to a hundred, so I had five percent of him. How much did you have? Well, in my in my if I if I were to play my my optimal set of of what, what did you play 150 lineups? Yeah, uh-huh. I would have had like 20 28 percent. Okay. Now, what my the my sim said it was the play was to just play Jack uh, Della. What's his name? Mandela. Della no, no, my mine, mine also. My to play him way less. Oh, the Della Madeline. No, my my. I mean, of course, I don't have a simulation process. I'm I'm doing. Yeah. It. But all I know, all I know is that for his price and based on his betting lines and his ownership, like I was like he was he was he came up as the as like the best value underdog. For yeah. His salary. But even, I mean, he was kind of one of the reasons, I think the reason I sent the tweet was like, even this guy, it's still not like, no, no, you got to play him at least 5%. Right. But, that's, um, but that normally happened. To me, that normally happens. The thing is, is that I'm, I'm typically when, when guys come up like less than 10%, when I'm building like 300 to 600 lineups, those are the guys that when I'm, I'm only playing 30 lineups. So it's like if they come in less than 10% in like out of 600 lineups, those are typically the guys that I just X out. Like, cause I'm only playing, I'm like, is it worth it for me to have one lineup with that? Like, maybe I, maybe it's just easier for me to just like, nope, not even going to bother with it. But I yeah. mean, we're, 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 we're saying essentially the same thing. Sure. Right. But I just, I, mean, I my, 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 my bug is on the word optimal. Right. Sure. I understand fair, fair what, enough. I understand what you meant. See, the thing is, I understand what you meant by the question. I'm not sure if other people understood what you meant by the question. I think they got it. I think they got it enough to where the nose is still surprised. Not surprising. It's I'm not, not surprised. Dude, I dude. just think, yeah, right. I'm not surprised. It's just, it's an interesting, interesting. Like, I think a lot of people who probably answered probably don't play 150s anyways. And, but yeah, like. But do I, people I really know. think that? I mean, like, if I look at the poll results, 298 votes. It's not a lot, yeah. Seventy-one percent no. Yeah, two hundred. Th- that's not a lot of votes, but that's still enough. I mean, that's still almost three hundred votes, and that's why, like Buffoon uh, said, you know, it depends on how you define optimal. That that's yeah, but everyone's going to say that. So, like, usually when I say when I when I when I make these, I say define blah, define X, however right. you see fit. Right. Just so I don't have to get these dumb comments. <laughs> <laughs> so you come uh, on a show actually, and I give you the <laughs> Optimal means blah, blah, blah. I said, just answer the dumb question. It's Twitter. <laughs> right. So I think Matt Hunter has the, has the the had the correct answer. The top what, 150 what lineups by EV likely aren't going to have every fighter. And that's the point that I was making. Yeah. But the probability of any individual fighter being in the optimal is almost always greater than one out of 150. So for a balanced approach, I'd say yes. Like, yeah, no, I don't think he's right. I don't think the top 150 
uh it can be but it can depending on the ownership of the fighters yeah, yeah. but not on an average slate i don't think so I and now well now we have to define uh, brian define average <laughs> well <laughs> average would be like right, average, any way that you want any way your you average want slate right <laughs> yeah so like even this 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 pet so like an like a non-average slate would be like eight fighters or when someone's owned at you know, 70% or something or higher that's your definition of average. Well, no, it's, that's just the, the, the facts of the matter. Like there's just so many slates and we can compare on find what slates are outlier slates. And there's just less of them that are eight right, or nine fighters and low way less of them have fighters who are owned over 60%. Do you even play those slates? Oh uh, yeah. I play them all. Nine fight, 10 fight cards. Who cares? <laughs> who cares do fine I, I thought i thought you're don't do me bro right yeah all right right yeah the thing that i that i found with with mma stuff is that uh i don't know what your what your sims do but i i found in studying other people that too many have a process that is like static for every for like everything and doesn't take into account the context of the slate. Like you have people that like they're playing these 47, two 48, four 47, six, like their average lineup is leaving over 2000 on the table on slates where there's like 700, you know, minus 7 million underdog, like favorites. And it's like, there are, there are combinations that are like duplicated two or three times that spend like most of the salary that you could get to that are like so much higher win pro like probability of winning that yeah. you shouldn't really be leaving 2000 on the table. Then there are slates where like the, the $9,500 favorites only like a two to one favorite. It's like, those are the slates where, yeah, now, now I'm leaving in order to avoid duplication. Now I could leave like 1500, 2000 on the table because those lineups have just as much of a win probability as the other ones. I find now, not all, but a lot of the 150 maxers, I look and I go, feels like they just built lineups. Like I've, I've looked at, like we had a slate the week before with a lot of big favorites. And I'm like, there was one 150 maxer that had at a minimum of 50 lineups that left like over 3000 on the table. And I'm, yeah. and I'm th this. What's your guess? What's your guess is why that happens. I have a, I have an opinion. Oh, I, I just guess that they, they just set a set like they they they're they're optimizing for uniques and not optimizing anything when it comes to like the probability of the lineup actually being the winner. That's this exactly. They're they're, they're they they they're making some like dupe calculator and then making a hard cutoff without taking EV or they're not taking salary dynamic into account at all. Well, I think just the chance of that lineup winning. You know, I guess you could look right. at it however you want, but right. but the, but yeah. the, the question the question I have, Brian, is that I have a process where I'm looking for the lineups that are possibly unique while spending most of the salary, and probably playing more of those. And I don't mind playing the ones that are close to that that are like duped two or three times. Uh, I can understand being like, no, I only want to play uniques even if I have the lower down on the salary, it just that makes no sense to me that some of these 150 sets are on. Like I look at, I look at, I I'll play 40 lineups and I'll have like 18 uniques and like 35 under fives. And I look at my 18 uniques and they're like 49, eight, 49, nine, 49, seven, 50 K. And those are unique lineups and they're not right. shared by like someone that has 147 out of 150 unique <laughs> and 75. And then most of their lineups, like, like they have like three lineups that spend more than 49, five. Yeah. It's like, well, this was a slate. There are uniques available. There are less of them. I understand there are less of them, but like you could find the ones that are, and like, wouldn't you rather play those than a lineup with five fucking plus three fifty underdogs in it? I mean, like, yeah. Yeah, and that was I think that was more popular a year and a half, two years ago to do the 150. Once whenever the we started the dupe thing on lulls, it right. started getting a lot more popular and people took it to an extreme where you really want you don't it's easy to not be duped, 
right? Like I can make it the shittiest lineup possible. No one's going to play it. Like if you want it, you can have it. I'll, I'll, I'll make it for you by hand. No Sims needed. And, um, but like you, what you, what you're really hoping for is to get lucky on not being duped. That's what, how you play it. DFS MMA. You're trying to get lucky to get. So was it last week or a couple weeks ago? No, yeah, the week before there was a week lineup that, that that had like four thirty percent on fighters. That was solo winner. Yeah, that so we're thinking the same one. And the if same one was like a forty nine three lineup. And I looked at the lineup and it said, "How the fuck was this solo?" Yeah, didn't I take like fourth or something in that? But yeah, one, one, yeah, one of those. Yeah, the one of those weeks is probably that week. And then if you look at, I got duped, and he won. Um, and if you look at our lineups, his lineup had more ownership. Like it was like yours. a, I was like a one-off as it always is. Right. right. And my guy was less owned than his. I mean, he won, but he also won on a single non dupe lineup. And I would have, if I would have won, I would have split or tri- or three ways. I can't remember. It was one of the, and it's just like, it's just pure luck. Like he, not just the win, obviously you want to always win, but like, that's another luck. The other luck in MMA is, he should he should have been the one who was duped three or four times, and I should have had the solo. Um, but and actually would have ended up costing me more money that way. But uh, th- but like he just got it just got lucky. So like he 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 got lucky mo- so many different ways, which is what it takes to win TFS tournaments because you're playing against thirty thousand other people, and it's really hard, and you got gotta get really lucky. And one of his luck was this lineup went off. The other luck was he had a lineup that had X percent of chance to be a single dupe lineup X percent, a chance to be double dupe X percent, a chance to be three. And he lucked out and hit the nuts on that too. You don't want to just go, okay, let's see if I leave $8,000 on the salary and play six underdogs. I don't think anyone's going to play this lineup, you know? So like, is is in your goal. Like I view it, I view it as my goal. When I say that I'm playing for under, like I optimize for under fives. Yeah. I want, I want, that there be four or less of my lineup, but it's not because I want to be duped three times. It's because I want to play a lineup that I expect to be duped three times that ends up only being duped once. Yeah. That's right. What I'm right. Like that, like that's really what, because if you're aiming for the uniques, you could be aiming. If not, if you have 145 lineups and no one else is playing there, that's a sign that like you, you didn't get lucky 145 times. Right. Like, a lot of these lineups are lineups that no one ever intended on playing. Right, right. For a reason. Yeah. Right. You want to be stuck in the spot where, like, oh, mo- most of my lineups should have been duplicated, but yeah, for them weren't. Yeah. Like that's and, that's where the EV comes from to me. And you can be duped thirty times or whatever, and that and lineup is just still good. You know, like right. it's still profitable. So, um, you don't want to get you don't want to get too carried away well actually i kind of you know i hope people get carried away so like <laughs> please go back to 150 n- not duping 150 times um and then occasionally those guys they get lucky in one of those hits and they solo ship but yeah you definitely would much rather be in a range and, or even like let's say you predicted it for five dupes right you or let's say you predicted for 10 dupes and it's going to be in there it's so good you still want to hope you get lucky and it's only do four times or five right. times or something like that. You're just kind of hoping they're a little bit off on those and you have something reasonable and you know, every slate's different. So sometimes you'll be a little higher. Sometimes you'll be a little lower, but like, yeah, on those slates where like all the, the, you know, good pros are like getting 10 dupes or around there, like a little higher 12 dupes, but the other person still not duped in 147 right. out of 150. Like clearly that can't be, you'd assume they'd look at that and go like, maybe I'm overdoing this. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there's a, maybe there's an issue, but I, to me, it comes down to the context. I mean, I just look and I go, what's the likelihood of these types of lineups being the winners when like, like, dude, what's the chances of both plus 1200 underdogs, not only winning, but also being optimal. Right. It's not just them. It's like, Oh, if you did the calculation just on money line, you just did no big money line and just use that as the sim which is essentially my rudimentary way of doing things, which is not as good as right. yours. Uh, it still doesn't say anything. It's like, oh, well, well, if that guy wins, well, what if he wins and only scores 63 points in a decision? Like, then right. that still doesn't matter. Like, like, so you need so many more things to happen. And it's not on a slate where that's likely to, to happen, but yeah. on a slate where it's 15 fights and the biggest 
favorite is minus 210. Like, those are the slates where those guys rake because the other people are like, nope, just going to play my 49 five plus lineups and blah, 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 blah. And there are plenty of unique combinations because there's 15 fights. But, like, dude, a lot of these 48 five lineups, like, if you just looked at the money line and inside the distance, like, like they have as much of a chance at being the highest scoring lineup as the 50K lineup. And these guys are just playing more of those. It just seems like people don't like. I, I look at the same people. I'll download the CSV and take a look, and I'll go, "Yeah, this guy is playing fucking forty six seven lineups." And and it's like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just don't tell him, Blender. Don't tell him. Well, that's why I didn't mention any names. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> should I not tell? If you're fucking up, should I not tell you either? Uh, you, you, you don't fuck up though, so it's hard. Listen to you, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I have your jersey. I'm a big fan of yours. I'm a big fan. I got. I put it on once. I put on this jersey once, and then I'm like, when will I ever wear a basketball jersey? And then, and then, when will I ever wear this out? Where right, I'd right. have to explain what the fuck this even means. If you make a live final, that'd be a good one to wear. Right. Oh, yeah, true. You're right. Yeah. I, it, but when do the fuck do I ever try for live final? Yeah. Maybe I do. Maybe I'll wear that if I make a live final. I'll, and and go. That's uh... right. But you're going you're gonna, to uh, DM me your, your address so I could. All right. Because yeah, I, I why, appreciate why, it. Just hanging up. I don't know. If I, I appreciate it. I think it. you have more use for it than me. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely. I'll, 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 I'll appreciate the uh, Brick 75 jersey. Right. So here's more, more, do- this is more donation. It's an adult extra large. You're good. You're good with that. That's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so if uh, p- people want to argue with you more about your, your fictional questions and your definitions of terms, <laughs> right. Define, define optimal, right. Are we going to call it we, that? Is that what we're going to call this episode? Define optimal. Um, I don't know, we've kind of been all over the map. Because you don't do that on lulls. You don't come up with like a title based on like what someone said on the show. No, Pete does the whole GTO, the real GTO, uh, meaning of GTO, YouTube strategy, like whatever, Keyword. whatever he thinks. Yeah, whatever. Right. Me, I just don't give a fuck. Right. I just right. make it's more entertainment value of like, oh, we talked about, we said something funny, and that's the title, even though it's. Not I don't either. Naked, but... Like, it's, I'm not, should I do naked yoga so we can tie the. Right. Tie yeah. This together. Naked yoga will. We'll get you a few more views. I think the audio podcast is a little different than YouTube. YouTube, they're those perverts are searching for naked right. yoga. You know what I mean? They're usually not doing that for audio only. ASMR. But ASMR, maybe. The it, it it I just think it's interesting, like getting what word will get you more what 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 uh facial expression on the thumbnail, you know, will get you actually right, exactly more more viewers. It's fun what different colors and stuff like that. I, I think that's interesting. Obviously, I don't do that on my channel at all. I don't even know how on some of that stuff, like making thumbnails. But I think it is cool looking at, at Pete's work and then seeing like, oh, actually, we got a few extra. We got an extra or a lot. Yeah, he does sometimes. it for that reason. I do it for like these types of shows are like, this isn't clickbait. No one's going to what I'm going to clickbait you until listening to a Right. Two talking heads for two hours, like right. But if like, you did a show it's every just, day, it's not going to lead to any watch time. So, like to me, I don't, I don't view it like that's not yeah. the game that I'm playing. For you, probably not worth it. But like if you did it every day and you really got dedicated and stuff like that, then it would probably, it'd probably be worth it to to just go straight whatever's going to get the clicks. Right. It's all about yeah. the clicks. So define define optimal. Are we defining optimal? Oh, uh, I mean, I don't know. I I know what G- game theory optimal means. That's what I thought you meant. No, yeah, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. You just meant whatever but, you think is best. <laughs> but no, I I meant it, I meant it like I mean, you know how people use GTO, like yes, like, and I they use it wrong also, right? I just did the laundry, you know, GTO style. I did it so fast, you know, like whatever, you know. It's like oh, the GTO lunch is to get eggs and, 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 you know, bacon, right. Or the GTO breakfast is eggs and bacon, right. Like they don't, it's not what GTO means at all. That's just, they're just saying like the best or the, the thing I like the most or something like that. But what would that's they, how if, I would if, do theoretically, what would be the GTO breakfast? I mean, I wouldn't not far off. I mean, omelet, eggs, uh, eggs, uh, sausage, bacon. So what would be the balanced, but 
truthfully, the GTO breakfast would be more calculated by like nutritional content than like describing it. Oh, I got you. I was, I was still using it and the, as the, you know, right. No, like I'm talking about what the, it would be. If it was like GTO would be like, well, based on your weight and based on everything like that would be 628 calories and 17% yeah. this, like it would be an entire nutritional backup of something. Right. I'm like, not whatever sure. fits yeah. that, that that's what you should be. Eating. I'm not sure how it would even apply to something like that because it's not a game, right? You're not playing in a heads up situation versus somebody. And there's no equal equilibrium, but there's a whole bunch of different branches of game theory too, that, that could apply, but I'm only you, familiar you're telling with me there's the no GPO one. for like the competitive eating. What's that? Say again. Competitive eating. Oh, right, right. Like yeah. So like that. Contest? Yeah, I'm sure there they could they could figure some some GTO out. I but think there's it's no, GTO. There's no GTO, it's just which is faster. Like that it's still the the whole GTO well, no, still doesn't apply. You might be able to there might be something. I'd have to think about it. But like I think of it like GTO, like like um like in baseball, I could see where you would mix your pitches based on this random frequency. Mm -hmm. And then like, you just give the catcher some randomizer that just buzzes them, you know, different way for which pitch each time. And the pitcher should just do it, what it says, you know? And so like, that's GTO to me. Right. But that doesn't apply to a hot dog eating contest. No, but, but there might be something I'd have, I mean, I have to think about it. Um, I don't really care to, but (laughs) guess i could <laughs> like because you are competing against somebody else so like you'd have you might want to take into account their actions uh but your actions don't affect their actions in that no there's no, no that, defense in, in competitive eating you no can't, because, like, knock knock their hot dogs out of their mouth well there might be like you might have like a backup plan where you can go into extra gear and like somebody surprisingly beating joey chestnut maybe he would change his strategies somehow i don't know um I don't know. I don't know enough about it, and I'd have to think think about it. Maybe there's not. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like like if you're not interested, it's like, nope. Sports betting not not a big deal. No, fuck it. Ain't doing it. Well, I mean, why would you you know care about something you're not interested in? <laughs> right. But I mean, just for for the you no, know, with with you, it's like either you really care about it, you don't care about it at all, or it's a bit. I guess I don't know. Like I, I think in conversations a lot of times, like, like, are you trying to persuade somebody, or are you not? You know what I mean? So like, like that's like a serious, like, okay, game theory optimal. Tell me how you're gonna do it. So like, I, but I'm not interested in persuading you or really thinking about it. Like, so I don't care. You know, like. Yeah, but that, like, but my, but with me, it I'm only one of those two things. Either I even I either want to have an actual conversation about GTO competitive eating, or it's a bit. Or it's a bet. Yeah, sure. Right. Fine. Yeah, fair. What I mean, what's there's I don't think there's anything in between on the GTO, the GTO side. I mean you're just you're just not used to being the bit guy. I'm not it's Pete's the bit guy. Pete's the bit guy. You're yes, the persuasion guy. Pete's the bit guy. <laughs> I guess. I guess. I I'm guess. just glad that we were able to spend almost two hours without riffing into libertarian. Right. politics or something well like that's that. when i stopped trying to persuade people was our last <laughs> podcast i was like that's the last one i'm ever doing like that <laughs> if you want to go back to episode 29 of this podcast right which is over two years ago wow i know we, we talked like the second half an hour was like you know, you're accusing me of stealing from my neighbors <laughs> oh right yeah yeah right oh so it's okay to take it from your neighbors Right. Yes. Libertarian theory. I'm it's I'm not uh, I'm not um, not big on proselytizing proselytizing. Is that the right word? Libertarian theory anymore. Well, you're done. You're done. You're done with that. No, I still I still uh, uh, most all of it's still logically correct, but it's just not that a waste of your time. It's not worth yeah talking about it with 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 somebody most of the time. And uh with most of and, the people that you with most of the people that you talk to regularly. And it's kind of like more of like a philosophy class, you know, philosophy class um ideology. So like unless you're f- interested in having a fun, you know, philosophical discussion, like you would talk about like, do we live in uh the matrix or do we live in 
um, whatever, the simulation, you know, right. people, we're all just in a computer simulation. Yeah. People will have fun conversations about that, but you moment you say anything about the police or taxes or something like that, for some reason they get emotional and, um, the, the conversation is no longer fun. So like, I don't, I'm not interested you, you in talk it. talk with Davis about it. He's, he's, he's interested in it though. Like he's, he's, um, a lot of times he's more open-minded than people give him credit for. So, uh, like, and also I've like moved him <laughs> quite, quite a bit, I think, because he can't defend himself against my arguments, but like, he doesn't really get emotional. He doesn't get emotional. Do I get emotional? It. Uh, most people do. I don't know. You, you, you do whatever you want to do, but right. like, um, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not a uh, interesting conversation to have. And again, like I said, it's like philosophy class. So like none of it's ever going to happen. It does, it's not real. And after COVID, like I, I'm just like not that interested in having those discussions. Like doesn't, they don't, it's not realistic. Like <laughs> the only thing that matters is power and its preferences. And like, you have no control over what they're going to do. Uh, but you could use it to your advantage. You know how I've used it to my advantage? How's that? Political betting. Yes, I'm still into politics. I've and I've posted, I've posted a couple bets uh, that I that I would have made if I still had money in my Bovada account. But the limits are so small. I I, and, like, I really wish they would legalize that in the states because it would they're be like never get, that's never going to happen because they're fucking assholes. But like right. the the uh, the how much were you at? No, no. On the and did you bet on the bid terms on Bovada? <sighs> I can't remember. I think how much, I made, how much were you able to get down? I made maybe some. I made some, made some personal bets. I think with people. Yeah, no, no, I, I did that. No, that's how I normally do because the yeah, I didn't bet on predicted or well, predicted is done. So you thank God too, by the way, right? Because I would I was way off. Um, I would have lost my ass. Oh, the and, midterms I crushed. Yeah, I know. I saw. Yeah, huh. and I was like, oh god, thank God, I actually didn't have any money on these sites. Yeah, I but Bovada, you can't get more. I, I wasn't able to get more like a hundred to two hundred bucks down. Yeah. Okay. So like, good. It's like, that's, that's one of the reasons I didn't get into it. It's like waste my time. I heard even predict it was like banning people or limiting people and stuff. It's like, what on this shit? Like it's not worth but the lines time. were so off that I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. It's like, it is fun. It's way more fun than sports betting for me. But like right. if they legalized it, they'd have like free polling for everybody. Right. Right. Of course. But they don't understand. Are you, right? I mean, you're you're preaching the choir. That's yeah. going to be a much more efficient market. The, oh, the, the thing about Nate Silver that, annoys me mm -hmm. and i'm not I, I i don't mind nate silver i i don't right. I, he gets a lot more shit than he deserves to get right. i agree if people don't understand probabilities mm -hmm. uh is that nate silver is not a professional better and he and he's he's said tons of stuff about like well he compares the 538 to like like the market right like like offshore books and everything like that and goes that that he uses that as part of like, well, that's the, that's the wisdom of crowd, the efficient market hypothesis. It's like these, does he not realize the limits are so low that these markets are nowhere near efficient at all. And they're highly emotional and right. highly oh, yeah. off that uh, yeah, you well, can't go by. Like dude, motivated, I mean, motivated betters. Right. Right. I want to go and open a Bovada account just so I could bet on Donald Trump. Right. right. That's and only not... for a hundred bucks, which right. then moves the, like these lines, you would see these lines move like insane. That Fetterman line in the yeah. midterms. Yeah. Like, Oh God. The fact that I could get him at plus plus one fifty when it's like, he's like a 97% chance of winning. Like how much money can I put down? Like, how, like, and then once you start adding these things up, it's like, once you get all these off market things, they don't let you parlay anything. So that's when you go into your, into your, your private Twitter DMS with the, especially people that are on the opposite political ideology of who's actually going to win. Right. And you go, uh, I think these four things are going to happen. Uh, what odds would you give me or something like that? Like I'll bet, I'll bet X amount. And they'll be like, yeah, sure. Let's bet five grand on it. And I'm like, okay. And then it's like, bing, bang, boom. And it's like, how the fuck did you know? It's like, yeah. Cause they're correlated to one another. Like, what are you a fucking idiot? Of course I don't say that, but <laughs> like, but, but I, I'm with you. I wish like, dude, cause I, you learned so much after the, 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 the 20, the 2020 election. Yeah. Like ever, I, I went in thinking that like, Oh yeah, the, the political betting markets are going to be efficient. Yeah. Once I saw how inefficient it was, I'm like, I got to get, I got to get the uh, 
my dry powder ready for I 2022. Was super show. Oh, 2016. I was yeah, 2016. Up. Right. Yeah, I was like, what? Like, I would have bet. I would have lost a mint on that uh, <laughs> on Trump winning. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I guess, with, these, but it's also these little markets. These, these, you know, who wins the governorship and whatever. Sure. And it's like it's it's a it's a race where it's a you don't realize like people are betting as if like, well, this guy's ahead of the poll of that guy, but it's like you see the returns coming in at like seven o'clock, and it's like you could use press presidential elections to see like well but Bi like biden had x percent of the vote or obama in 2016 and it just basically shows you turnout because yeah we both know that it's very much there's not not many much in the middle people it just comes down to turnout so once you could see he's always oh, he's, he's he's his returns are ahead of his rate let me, before let me say this let me cut you off before i forget we should i've wanted to do this we should do this we should do uh maybe we can ask more people if you want to do it I wanted to do a live show last election. Like we should do a live show live and do like, that yeah, would be fun. Wouldn't it? Like, yeah, uh, no, I, 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 I ele midterms and presidential elections. Are midterm like and presidential. Yeah. Yeah. We'll they're my super. I like, even if yeah. I wasn't betting, I'd be like, I turn on once the seven o'clock, this first stall poll to me, it's like, it's like watching the NFL draft. Right. It's like, like it's part of my day. It's like, this is, I look forward to it. Me too. As long as there's not going to be any like, preaching to me about fucking whatever you know right, what I mean? no, like, no, no this it's is all betting not you it's i'm saying bet, like, right it's all whoever betting. we invite on right i'll be um, down for that yeah that would be fun we should we should do that and then because there's a lot of like live like in the in the 2020 when trump was ahead in the where with the south or whatever florida right and then the market shifted in arizona and because they they're not closed yet like all that shit is really Right, and then people didn't realize that, that the southern southern Florida is not representative of fucking anything. Right. Well, and then also because of the overnight votes, right. it actually they he didn't win Michigan and and Wisconsin and right. Pennsylvania and whatever. So like it had he won those, he probably would have won Arizona won all easily. the other ones. Right. Exactly. Right. But yeah, so it's all and it's all correlated. So that's that's all just. That's all fun stuff. And I saw some poker players had their own live stream. So it's like, oh, maybe we should, someone should do uh, one with the DFS sports betting guys. That would be fun. Yeah. Let's, let's plan on that. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's I mean, we got a while, got October, right? Or uh, well, next no, November. November. Well, I, 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 I have a fictional bet that I can't place. Like that, that to just to, to add the politics to the end of this episode, mm -hmm. I would bet. I don't know what odds you would have to give me. I, and I've, I've, I've said this for the past four years. I do not think that the 2032 presidential election happens on election day. 2032? Yes. Okay. Uh, you're Okay. So now you're saying for any reason. For any reason, right. Yeah. The, what I'm really saying is that I don't think the 2032 presidential election even happens yeah but it's at least delayed or it's at like okay th there's something happens in which it's one, not done on election one caveat would be you can't interfere yourself right of on election <laughs> right. but I'm, I'm under the guise that the 2032 election will either be called off or moved due to threats of violence or right. some type of Gotcha. Where you're saying this, bomb this threats or this culture war will boil, right. boil over by this election point, right? Yeah, where, could where they would have next to postpone the election, right? Could even be this next one, right? Well, that well, I I I propose the 20. I I'm a, I'm going under the assumption that that uh Biden wins mm -hmm. and that a Democrat also wins in in I'm 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 assuming Democrats win the presidential election until mm -hmm. 2032, and then a Republican wins or might win, and that's when shit hits the fan or something. No, no, that that there's a that whoever wins in 2028, especially if it's I don't necessarily think it's Kamala Harris, but if it if it's so if it's someone that looks like like her, mm -hmm. I think that there'll be enough that there'll be enough. But we already had someone who looks like her win multiple. Yeah, they'll make they'll make a lot of other people angry also and more angry. <laughs> but the, but it does happen. I, I'm, I'm just of, I'm just of the yeah. belief that that the country. At some point in the next ten to fifteen years, yeah, enters 
some amount. It's not, I wouldn't call it a civil war. Yeah. But a, a, a similar well, to like a, a Northern Ireland. Sure. I got you. Where there's like just so much domestic violence, so much, uh, you know, domestic yeah. terrorism on not just one side, but right. Yeah. I was going to say, like, you don't think a person who's like Donald Trump or, in your opinion, worse than Donald Trump, if they got elected, that wouldn't right. cause some violence. Right. Like, of course it would. I'm yeah. just saying something happens yeah. and that I, that it may not, that, well, what people, odds would you give me on one state seceding? I know we can't do any of these bets, but like before the year 2050 or something. I, I don't know about, I mean, who knows? I mean, the reason you can't do some of these bets is that if these things types of happen, it's like, is it, shit, it's one of those things of like, I'm going to bet on the apocalypse. It's like, well, right. the money doesn't mean anything right. anymore. Like, what is it? What does it no, matter? I know, but like, but you can also just make fun, like make right. the. Uh, I don't know. I don't think. Fun. I I, th I think it's it's more it's more likely that we You'd get give a, me like plus eight hundred or plus ten thousand or. Oh, uh, I don't. I don't know. How, I don't know how to line that. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard. What is the what it would be the process to six? I mean, to legally secede or fun or just well, I would do it the, the same way as your bet for whatever whatever means necessary. Right. One yeah, but the, one state is no longer part of the union. Is. Like, dude, Flor at this point, Flor maybe Florida has already seceded under under some 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 people's definition. If you take a I look mean, at what's going on down there. Speaking of Florida, like, I, uh, if the markets were li liquid, I would have made money on DeSantis, like, because I would have bet him at like whatever it was, one hundred one thirty one when he first came on the market, and then I want to sell him now. And in a liquid right. market, you'd be able to sell off. At his whatever he is now, like three to one or whatever. Like, I don't think he's got, I don't think he's going to win now right. at all. I didn't think he was going to win before either. I just 30 to one, 50 yeah, to one. The odds were worth, worth. Right. Yeah. Like, and if I could have got RFK at like 20 to one, that would have been nice. And then uh, you could, right. but there's no cash outs. There's, I'm right. There's, it's no, not, there's no liquid market. And right. yeah. So, like, if they, if they legalized it, like, there'd be all sorts of fun. Dude, if they legalized it, I, I would, cons I, dude, I'd be betting, I'd, I'd probably be betting on like, on state elections, primaries. I oh mean, yeah, just yeah, anything. Because, I mean, like, dude, they have elections all the time. Now, here's one thing where they could get illegal, like, trouble is like because I worked at the Capitol. I knew I know lobbyists and pollsters, like mm -hmm. legitimate poll. I could ask, like, hey, what's the next poll before it comes out? Like, I might be able to get that info. Yeah, but then didn't you? What would happen is that the books would profile and limit sharp act. I mean, it would be the right same thing. for sure. For sure. Once you, when they know that you're that once you put five hundred bucks down on this thing, they're gonna. But make I'm saying the, efficient. the reason why they could make an argument not to legalize it is because of like insider trading, of like right. right. So like, but of course this whole thing's ridiculous. Like me and you betting is gonna change the federal <laughs> election outcome. You know, it's it, and and like and what's their max gonna be five grand maybe even if it was like you know so like right. It's one of those things when when you see the state legislators. Talk about fixing games, high school games, yeah, as right. if like like no one's fixing a game for a fifty dollar max bet, right? Right. right. And it's then ridiculous. when it comes to NBA games, it's like uh, no player that's making ten million dollars a year is risking it on a ten thousand dollar bet. It's crazy. Like you'd have to pay these guys because it's their reputation, it's their it's their career long possible earnings at risk, all their sponsorships. Their personal pride and everything. Like, it would, how much would it cost to pay off a guy who makes four million dollars a year? Like, and he that four million dollar player has to be on like a rookie deal because like he he needs to be an important cog. If you pay off the left outside linebacker mm -hmm. who's making five million dollars a year, how much can you get bang for your buck? And it would cost you a hundred million dollars at least to buy him off. No, this but the, the the point that the the reason which I could, I, I mean, I'm typically with you on this side that I yeah. think that athletes should be allowed to fucking bet yeah, fuck it. on other things. I understand the point. Like what the argument is not in what of them being paid off is that let's say, I mean, I don't think there's a straw man example. This is, okay. a, this is a common example of you have, it could be an NBA player. It could be whatever, but especially college, probably a college player bets a ton, doesn't bet it through a regulated market, bets it through bookies or whatever. 
the wrong crowd. He owes $200,000 to some mobster or someone like that. And in order to pay it off, he has to fix a game. So that it doesn't matter. Like it could be an NBA player. Like, like, dude, we know like my Michael Jordan or Charles Barkley or Phil Mickelson, you know, they, these guys bet a ton of money. Who knows that they don't owe $50 million to some Russian oligarch. And it's like, like they they can't afford to pay that off, and they're like, well, now we're gonna just start rigging NBA. But that that could happen anyways. Well, of course. Yeah, like if a mob, if like a mobster character, and I'm I mean I'm not sure how uh, uh, legitimate the mob in their power and, and what they're willing to do is. Like it's the Sopranos. I'm not sure they're even around like that anymore. Like, but like um, like but if they wanted to get at you. They could find they a way, you anyway, whether right? you owe them five million dollars or not. Um. So, like, yeah, that. I, I, but I get it. Sure, it's not straw man, but like, I don't think it's a very strong argument no. for, for, for having this, for having such a high regulatory burden. It's just a, it's, it's just a political, it's just a part of the game, you know, of politics. It means it, they, they don't know what they're doing. They, they have no expertise in this area. It's it, they're they they need revenue for their state because states actually do have budgets, unlike the federal government. They they actually can't just print money, so they do worry about getting money, and and like they just have to go like, okay, well then we also need to appease the anti gambling lobby association. Okay, we'll put this in here, we'll put that in here until enough people stop complaining and they could pass pass the bill to get some money. Yeah. Just like like you said, it's all about about your allies and your enemies. And right, that's all politics is. Right. Yeah, allies. Are you and my enemies. ally? Or are you my enemy? Well, uh, we're enemies, technically. Oh, we are. We're technically enemies. <laughs> we're political enemies, <laughs> and <laughs> and we play against each other in DFS. So I don't know, man. <laughs> you play. We don't always play in the same contest. No, I know. I'm kidding. Anyways, right. Uh, we have no power, so it's irrelevant. It's that's that's. Uh, okay. Oh, oh, so it doesn't even matter. <laughs> <It> doesn't matter. <laughs> this conversation will have no effect on the world. Everyone's safe. Uh, so yeah, it, it really, it, it, that's, that's for them. You know, that's for them to have their, their power games, not for us, unfortunately. So if uh, anyone listening wants to think it's a good idea to dirt for the 2024 midterm, the 20, no, 2024 presidential election. Yeah. That, you know, we, we will do it. Maybe we do it on Pete's do it with, through, with Pete or with you. We'll do it through somewhere. No. Yeah. I, I'll, 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 I'll bring it past him. But that's a little spicy, I think for his. Right. But I mean, we're, we're literally, we're like 16 months away. No, isn't it? Oh yeah. It's next year. Right. It's next oh my year. God. Right. Holy cow. Yeah. Well, well, you pro- well, your primaries, we're not going to do streams for the primaries. Super right. Tuesday stream. <laughs> we mm. could. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll do one of those for fun, but yeah, the big right. one's the election day. That's right. so fun. The election day is fun too. Right. Yeah, but I mean, I can see doing a suit if it's close enough. If it if the if the Republican primary is close enough, I just don't think it's going to be. I mean, these are going to be. I think they're going to be interesting. I think I think both Democrat and Republican are going to be interesting. I think RFK is going to poll. Next poll is going to come out. I bet he's in the thirties. It would not shock me. High thirties. We'll see. I could be wrong, but and then and then with DeSantis falling apart, um, what it supposedly looks like. I mean, Vivek Ramaswamy's getting up there in the double digits. The reason, the, the re, I think he's a good debater, though. So I think it would be interesting to see, and they're going to be ready for Trump this time on the debate floor. So, like, I don't think it's going to be like a Jed Bush beer, deer in headlights situation when he comes on and insults you. So I think that could be entertaining. But yeah, right now the Republican Party is not looking as competitive. As it was. I'm just saying from a betting standpoint on a Super Tuesday, you know. Yeah, like who gets out? The live stream and going, oh, Sorry, well, yeah. take a, I think by that point, it's going to be kind of like inevitable. Right. On what's like, it's not going to be as interesting as as if it was a much more competitive. Yeah. Like if it was like, oh, there's three people and we don't know. And like almost like the, de- the Democratic primaries the last time out. Right. Like Biden comes in fifth. And then right. the Nevada turns around like. Like then at least okay, there's something there's 
That it, was highly field. competitive, yeah. Right. I don't want to have a stream where we have to determine whether or not it's worth betting on Trump minus 2,500 or minus right. 5,000. Right. Like, that's not it. Fair enough. Right. Yeah. Which might be what happens. So, right. yeah. Super Tuesday might not be worth it. It's true. Right. But the election day, either way, it will be. But I'm, but I'm glad that someone, I, I, this is the first time, it's like, oh, oh, someone that actually finds it entertaining and would bet on Right. It. Yes. It's super entertaining. It's, it's just when people get all emotional about it. It's just like, ugh. Like take you gotta take yourself right. out. I don't get emotional. I just I have my political list and I just I follow all the pollsters and I'm seeing like returns are coming in here. Here's a link to the state website yeah. and you go through and it's like oh yeah I'm not saying like, you all are all these I'm other sure. people are betting emotionally. Why don't I just bet based on what the numbers say? Right, right, right. Yeah, true. <sighs> okay, Brian Hooper underscore underscore. Uh, you're not on yeah. threads, right? No, I still haven't done an account. I guess yeah, we yeah. all are on threads though, since it's just your Instagram account. Right. That I, I, I think I think that's gonna be dead within a week anyway. Yeah, uh, the numbers it, are it's already I, I went over there, I, I secured my my name, I put oh. my little bio, I checked it every once in a while when like, oh, someone followed me. Okay. Just to make sure, just like, oh, people from Twitter that I would ever, and then like after a couple of days, like there's not a chronological feed and barely anyone that I care about is there enough. And then I go on Twitter and right. those same people are still posting the same thing on Twitter. And right. I'm like, why the fuck am I here? I'm not going to spend time trying to get thousands of followers on threads unless it's, I have to. So just <laughs> Twitter and my website. So brick 75.com or the draft goes to the same spot. Yeah. And I'm yeah. at blender HD. And as always, you get the 15 hour audio DFS masterclass theory, of daily fantasy sports at theoryofdfs.com.